Okay, we'll get started right now. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is David Sykes. I'm the city manager here in San Jose. And I wanna welcome everyone today's, uh, to today's police chief candidate forum. Um, as has been well publicized, we've done everything we can to uh, establish a, a diverse candidate pool and a, and a candidate pool that has internal and, and external perspectives. And I believe we have uh, achieved those objectives. Um, this is the first time uh, that we as a city have uh, developed a process like this, a, a transparent process whereby you, the community, get to see the finalists. Um, and that's what today is about. Um, and I think we certainly all recognize the importance that a police chief plays, uh, the role that they play in terms of serving our community. Uh, make no mistake about it, all of these candidates are qualified. They have decades of experience. Um, what we're trying to do now in the process is find the best fit uh, for San Jose. And, and today's really the beginning of that process. Um, I wanna kind of just uh, lay out some of the things that, that I think we're looking for, but certainly the community has been very involved with, with shaping this process and giving input. We, we are looking for someone who's open-minded and ready to engage in a dialogue that challenges conventional wisdom. Um, someone who embraces new approaches to public safety and builds on the progress that uh, our department has made through years of reform. Uh, we're looking for someone who's inclusive, insightful, adaptable, uh, works effectively in our very diverse community, and, and very important, someone who that is prepared to lead the most thinly staffed large police department in the entire country. Um, so no easy task. Um, but that's what we're looking for, somebody who can do all those things and has all those attributes. Um, it's my role as city manager to select the police chief. All the department heads work for me. Um, and the way our process works, once I make that selection, with a lot of help <laughs> from uh, uh, community members and panelists and, and in stakeholders, but once I make that decision, then I go to the council for confirmation. And, and the council, the mayor and the council either confirm or don't confirm uh, my selection. Um, you know, so today we really truly are at a, a transition point from kind of the recruitment process to really the selection process. Um, after today's forum, uh, the candidates will go through an extremely rigorous um, interview process. We've got uh, 50 community leaders and other stakeholders involved. And as I said, very rigorous interview process that will follow this. Um, all of your, your participation today is, is greatly appreciated. Um, and, and today's the, the first opportunity for you all as a community to get to hear from uh, our, our finalists. Um, the questions that will be asked today uh, were put together into themes based on 500 questions that uh, our community uh, provided to us through the, the survey process. So. Uh, today's forum is really about uh, an opportunity to hear from the candidates and see how they respond to these questions that uh, that are coming from uh, our community. Um, so good luck to all the candidates today. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce uh, Gary Peterson. He is the CEO of Public Sector Search and Consulting. He's been our recruiter through the process, and he is our facilitator for today's forum. So uh, thank you, Gary, and take it away. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager. I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to join the city manager in welcoming all the candidates and the viewers at home. Uh, for, day, for today's forum, we'll be using the following format. Each candidate will provide a brief opening statement. We'll be followed by five questions taken from the top five themes as the city managers described. Each candidate will have three to four minutes to respond. I will make sure they stay on time and, uh, and tell you how much time you have left, candidates. We'll be rotating the order of who answers first so that everyone gets an opportunity to go first, second, and, and so on. If there's enough time at the end, we'll also ask the candidates to provide a, a brief closing statement. Should be noted that uh, the forum is being interpreted in Spanish and Vietnamese and broadcast on separate YouTube channels. 
So with that having been said, let's, we wanna hear from the candidates. I wanna start with introductions and we're gonna start in alpha order, uh, starting with Chief Bowers. Please take three or four minutes and tell the community about yourself and why you wanna be the next police chief for the San Jose Police Department and the city of San Jose. Well, good morning, Gary. Um, it's an honor to be here today, uh, to have this opportunity to talk with, uh, with you all and the public who's all turning, tuning in uh, about the areas that they're concerned about. Uh, my name is Jeremy Bowers, and I'm the Chief of Police with the Piedmont Police Department. Uh, but before I get into um, you know, my professional background, um, I just wanna provide an opportunity uh, for those who are watching uh, to have some insight uh, into who I am uh, as a person. Uh, I'm the son uh, of loving parents. Uh, my father's African-American. Uh, my mother's Italian-American. Uh, my Italian grandparents immigrated uh, to the United States uh, at a young age with their families, uh, looking for opportunity uh, and a better life. Uh, my African-American grandparents um, persevered uh, through tough times and segregation. Uh, at 21, I began my career with the city of San Jose, and I met a young woman who eventually became my wife, uh, a woman who was born and raised in East San Jose. Uh, the daughter uh, of a Mexican-American father and an Italian-American mother whose families also came uh, to the city of San Jose uh, for a, a brighter future. Uh, families who still have deep roots in the city of San Jose. So when I think about the multiculturalism uh, of my family, uh, an extended family, uh, I see the beauty and the diversity of it. I see, the, I see how distinct each of the segments of it are. I see the strength of it when it comes together. And that's really the lens through which I see the city of San Jose, a city whose diversity and inclusive drive stand out as its strength. Uh, my experiences, uh, my assignments, my command opportunities have spanned um, operations, uh, investigations, administration, and training. Uh, a few of the assignments that I had, which were very formative for me, um, included the time I spent as the adjutant to the chief of police. I did that for two different chiefs of police over, over a number of years and uh, really had the opportunity to look at uh, a view of, of, of policing in San Jose uh, from the office of the chief of police. I have that experience. I have that understanding of those dynamics because I had a front row seat for it. I was assigned as the training commander of the organization where I was charged with delivering outstanding uh, training to the men and women of the police department from the time that they came into the department throughout their entire careers. And then I also had the honor of aiding in the establishment and coordination of the chief's community advisory board. Um, where basically uh, it's an entity that still exists to this day. Um, and it's, a, it's an important part of the relationship between the department and the community. Um, I've sought and attained higher education. Uh, I received my Bachelor of Science degree from San Jose State University and my Master's degree from the University of California, Irvine. I care about San Jose. I care about the San Jose Police Department and the women and men in it. For me, this opportunity to return um, is not just professional, um, it's personal. Uh, that's why the decision to take a leadership uh, opportunity uh, and broaden my perspective uh, was the most difficult decision I've ever had to make personally and professionally. Um, I love being in the organization of San Jose, uh, but I wouldn't be here now uh, to lead uh, the department um, in endeavoring this work with the community in the same way as its chief without the differentiated experience and perspective uh, I gained uh, as a chief of police for the last four years, engaged in leading during this time and evolution of policing. Uh, again, uh, I'm honored for this opportunity uh, to come back home uh, and I look forward uh, to the rest of the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bowers. Um, we're gonna move on to Chief Dahl for your introduction. Take, please take three or four minutes and tell everyone about yourself and why you wanna be the next police chief um, in San Jose. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. And uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone. I really am honored to be uh, a part of your selection process. I know how important it is uh, for a community when you're selecting a chief of police. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just really pleased to be able to participate. Um, my name is Justin Dahl. I'm the chief of police here in Anchorage, Alaska. I've been chief here for about four years. Um, just a little bit about me. I, uh, I was born in Oregon. I still have lots of family in that area. My family moved us to Anchorage when I was fairly young and I went to junior high and high school here uh, and ultimately college. Um, I've been with the Anchorage Police Department since 1996. Um, I've been very fortunate to have uh, a variety of assignments throughout the years, uh, doing lots of fun things, but uh, also lots of very developmental things for myself, uh, but also 
I've had a hand in, uh, in developing the department over the years. Um, I've had assignments, uh, you know, as you can imagine at this point in my career in places such as uh, investigations and administration, um, and ultimately as chief of police for the last four years. Um, uh, a little bit more about me personally, um, I have a, a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Alaska and also a master of public administration from the University of Alaska. Um, I've uh, attended the FBI National Academy to further develop um, my education as a police commander and also uh, the FBI's National Executive Institute, which is a leadership institute for chiefs of uh, large city police departments. Um, my wife, Monique, and I have been married for uh, over 20 years, and uh, we enjoy spending time together uh, fishing and uh, boating here in Alaska. Um, I also uh, enjoy motorcycle riding and a variety of other sort of nerdy technical things in my off time. And uh, we, have, uh, we have three dogs that keep us very busy, two basset hounds and a dachshund, so um, very active personal life. Uh, you know, I am, uh, I'm very excited to be uh, in this process and under consideration for uh, the chief's job in San Jose. Um, my wife and I have uh, literally grown up uh, here in Anchorage, and, uh, and Anchorage has a very um, small town feeling and sense of hometown pride. And as I've talked to people uh, in and around San Jose over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, trying to do the best I can to uh, get a feel for the city, my sense is that San Jose has that same feeling. You have that, that feeling of hometown pride, um, a lot of uh, sense of accomplishment for your city, and, and that's really what we're looking for as we um, find our next adventure in life. Um, we know that we're ready to, to move on from Alaska. And uh, as we've considered where we might go next, we've been very interested to find a combination of um, environment and, uh, and the makeup of the department that would be um, a good landing spot for us. And, and we really think that San Jose is it. Um, San Jose is a beautiful city. It has uh, a wonderful uh, diversity to it. And you have a wonderful police department. Everywhere that I look, when I look at uh, wh what San Jose Police Department is doing, I see that you have a strong police department. It's very modern, forward thinking, um, and it has the support of its community. And, and that's really the place that I want to go next um, to provide leadership and, uh, um, and share my experience and perspective, you know, and, and bring a, a slightly different perspective to to help build on the really solid foundation that San Jose already has. So again, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of the process and looking forward to getting to meet everyone as we move along. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, next is Deputy Chief Mata. Um, introduction of yourself, three to four minutes, uh, and why you want to be the next police chief. Thank you, Jerry. Buenos dias y gracias por asistir en este foro. Me llamo Antonio Mata y yo soy vice jefe de policía del Departamento de Policía de San Jose. My name is Antonio Mata. I am uh, the assistant chief in San Jose. I'm very happy to be here to be the next chief. I can assure that we are here to help you and protect you because we are all part of a community. As always, I'm here for you and thank you and have a good day. I'm excited and honored to be a finalist for the San Jose Police Chief position and to lead this amaz the amazing men and women of this department. It's important for everyone to know my journey and why I am the best choice for this to lead this department. My purpose has always been to help others and to give back to the community. Leading this department at this difficult time will be a great opportunity for me as I will guide and support our dedicated workforce and support and advocate for our community. My vision for the department is that all residents and visitors of this city have the highest trust and confidence in this department. I will do this by ensuring that we become a highly engaged department through excellent service at all levels and by building relationships with all stakeholders. This is something I have done for the last 30 years and will continue to do. My journey began by being born and raised in the inner city of Chicago. I, like many of our communities, experienced 
living in a high crime area where gangs and violence exist. I also experienced racism, poverty, and limited opportunities growing up in one of the most segregated cities. Having lived these experiences has provided me, has made me and provided me the person I am today, valuing and demonstrating honesty, compassion, equity, and true relationships. I started working at the age of 12, which allowed me to pay for my education. I attended the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I earned a bachelor's in criminal justice. While attending college, I worked for the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, where I was fortunate to work with and learn from criminal justice leaders and prominent professors in the field. I was a member of the Chicago Police Department briefly before joining the San Jose Police Department in March of 1996. During my 25 years at San Jose PD, I have worked in critical assignments. I attended San Jose State University where I earned my master's in public administration. As a commanding officer, I implemented various programs and policies to advance the department in partnership with our community. I have also ensured that our workforce is reflective of our community through assignments and positions. As the department's most senior deputy chief, I have prepared for this position by completing the necessary executive trainings such as the Senior Management Institute for Police, the California Police Chiefs Association, and California's Post Executive Development Programs, and recently completed the Police Executive Leadership Institute Alumni Series sponsored by the Major City Chiefs Association. As an executive officer, I'm heavily engaged with the community and have always been since the start of my career. All of these experiences and my background have prepared me to lead the San Jose Police Department. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief uh, Mata. Uh, next, uh, Deputy Chief Randall. Um, three to four minutes uh, introduction and why you wanna be the next chief. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Good morning. I'm Heather Randall. I'm a Deputy Chief here at the San Jose Police Department and it's an honor to be here. Um, I'll spend a few moments talking about my experience and who I am. I was born and raised here in San Jose um, so I have a deep connection to this community and I am fiercely committed to this city and the department and its success. Uh, before coming to San Jose PD, I earned my bachelor's degree in psychology from UC San Diego. I was a behavioral therapist for the Center for Autism, working on classroom integration for children. Um, so a little different background than most, um, but I began my career here at San Jose in 1998 and I'm going on my 23rd year here. I've had many opportunities in my career and I'm very grateful for all of them and I've had the chance to lead and make meaningful change within our department. Um, we all have storied careers as you will hear um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've been given here to grow and develop within my career. Um, I've had the opportunity to be a detective in our sexual assaults unit, our vice and special investigations, internal affairs, our media relations unit, and our recruiting and background unit where I had the opportunity to build a team restructure our recruiting outreach and backgrounding process and successfully uh, brought in the most diverse academies we've ever had here in the history of San Jose Police Department. Something I'm very proud of. I was promoted to captain where I oversaw the Western Division, um, a very busy division and launched our first crime data intelligence pilot program. I was promoted to deputy chief where I oversaw our Bureau of Investigations and had the opportunity to stand up a new unit, one that's very near and dear to my heart, our special victims unit um, that focuses on human trafficking, internet crimes against children, and our 290 registrant compliance. Currently, I oversee our largest bureau, our Bureau of Field Operations, uh, where I oversee over 800 sworn employees and 120 civilian staff. Um, and it's something that I'm very connected to. I think we have outstanding officers here and, and they really enjoy their work. Um, I bring a different perspective to the leadership team here in our department. Um, one that's never been elevated to the position of chief in 170 years. And I'm very proud of that. Um, and I know that San Jose is the finest police department in the nation, but we do have a lot of work to do, a lot of outreach, a lot of community engagement that we need to do. And I think we're all up for the task. The events of recent have shown us that we can't point outward and that we must look inward. It's very important. 
Our department's not broken, but a new perspective can keep us moving in the right direction uh, during this very important time. So I wanna thank you for this opportunity and thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Deputy Chief Randall. Um, Assistant Chief uh, Scarato, uh, three to four minutes, introduction, why you wanna be the chief in San Jose. Good morning, everyone. My name is Larry Scarato. I am retired Assistant Chief from the City of Pittsburgh Bureau of Police. I'd like to start with saying thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this process, uh, the most, one of the most important processes that a city will undertake, and that's appointing the next chief of police. A little personal background about me as we get started. I'm the proud son of Jerry Scarato and Leroy Taylor, a child of a multiracial relationship. I identify as a black man. As a child and a young adult growing up in public housing and in poverty, my lived experiences are very similar to, to communities of color today. I remember being one of the only brown kids in Catholic school to pay for lunch with blue chips, like the food stamps my mom used at the grocery store. My mom was a single parent. She worked tirelessly to ensure my sister and I were taught invaluable life lessons to be successful as adults. She taught me lessons like perseverance, commitment, dedication, but, but maybe most importantly, that what anything was achievable, no matter where you came from, as long as you were willing to work hard for it. And, and I plan to bring those values and life lessons with me to San Jose, if given the opportunity to become your next chief. Uh, more about me on the professional side. Uh, I am, I have been a police officer for 25 years and in executive leader position, executive leadership positions for prior eight with the Bureau. The PVP consists of 920 sworn officers and about 65 civilians, which is just a little bit smaller than SJPD. I started policing when I was 19. Is the only job I ever wanted to be a part of. And, and I worked my way up through the ranks to become the youngest assistant chief in the department's history. I know challenging and rewarding, how challenging and rewarding this profession can be because I have worked in almost every capacity of law enforcement, from being a canine handler to the motorcycle unit, narcotics to internal affairs. I was the sergeant in charge of our crimes against children unit. And, and along the way, I never skipped rank on my way to assistant chief. As a promoter leader, I always wanted to ensure I was approving the department for the officers and the communities in which we serve. Uh, my goal is to build bridges with the community to improve our officers' everyday work life and, and experience within the organization. And, and to be a forward thinking leader, I think I've accomplished it in every position I've had. Um, as a commander, uh, with Patrol District, I focused on community police relationships to support a collaborative problem solving with our officers, our residents, and our business partners. The goal during my tenure there was to create an environment our officers were visible, accessible, and build sustainable relationships that reflect 21st century policing tenants. Uh, from patrol, I moved to oversee our major crimes division, which included homicide. Uh, not like any other major city, we were experiencing high instances of gun violence resulting in death. Uh, engaging our communities and stakeholders, I led the implementation of our group violence intervention strategy that used precision policing directed at the most likely people to commit violence. That strategy had a dramatic impact on gun violence with, with murders decreasing 47% from 2014 to 2019, and had, we had the lowest number of murders in 20 years in 2019. Uh, when I became the Assistant Chief of Professional Standards, I had responsibility for training, policy, criminal intelligence, labor management and officer accountability. Um, my first responsibility was to implement the recommendations from the president's task force on 21st century policing. And I did that by creating a procedural justice unit within our training academy that was responsible for educating every officer, all 920 in the principles of PJ and more importantly, implicit bias. Uh, that training focused additionally on the implementation of PERF's, PERF's 30 guiding principles on use of force and de-escalation techniques, all to ensure we're aligning our officers training with the organization's values and being certain we treated every member of our community with the level of dignity and respect that they deserve. Uh, if given the opportunity to lead the SJPD, I will continue to be that transformational leader, uh, build genuine community police partnerships, and on a daily basis, challenge the organization to be better and do better. Uh, thank you for your time and I look forward to the process. Thank you, uh, Chief Scarato. Um, next up is uh, Captain Todd. 
three to four minutes, uh, why you want to be the uh, police chief in San Jose. Introduce Good morning. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I've got to start out by saying, because today is New Year's, I, my family would uh, not forgive me if I didn't say Namai for, for everybody watching today. So uh, just really quickly about myself, I was born in Vietnam in 1975. My family immigrated to the United States. That's our story kind of started in Pensacola, Florida, but we didn't stay there very long. We ended up uh, living in Mobile, Alabama for several years. So that was where some of my formative years were at uh, when I was younger. In 1980, uh, we ended up moving to uh, a little city called San Jose. We heard that there was a booming uh, Vietnamese community growing in San Jose. And in fact, today, San Jose City is the largest Vietnamese community outside of Vietnam in the entire world. So that's how robust uh, the community has become in, in just a short period of time. In 1995, I was hired by the San Jose Police Department. Uh, I have uh, pretty much worked in a variety of different um, assignments. So I started like we all do in patrol. I uh, then became an undercover officer working as a deep cover officer for the FBI task force. At the time, we were experiencing some violent crimes that were stemming from the card clubs. Uh, following that, I was a gang detective uh, in the early 2000s. That's where I started working with at-risk youth and working with the other partners that we have dealing with gang violence and, and at-risk uh, behavior. I then became uh, a field training officer. I, I went back to the community and this capacity training young officers to be uh, solo beat officers. Following that, I was a robbery detective investigating and apprehending violent predators, oftentimes victimizing older people and, and females. Uh, following that, I switched gears. I, I became a auditor. So I was uh, one of four hand selected auditors to conduct internal audits for the department looking for policy and procedure vulnerabilities and conducting workflow analysis. I then took command of our traffic enforcement unit, our motorcycle unit. Uh, in San Jose, this is probably one of the most serious issues that we have in our city. In fact, uh, many years we either uh, equal or, or sometimes even double the amount of traffic fatalities we have uh, in comparison to our homicides. Following that, I went to take command of our, our sexual assaults investigations unit. This is the largest unit within our detective bureau. Uh, under my purview, I had sexual assaults, human trafficking, <clears throat> Megan's Law detail. I had internet crimes against children. I had all of juvenile crimes and I had all of missing persons. So that was a very challenging assignment. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been back in the community working as a division commander working in the Foothill Division, which is our east side. Some of these neighborhoods are probably our most needy neighborhoods um, in the entire city. I have a master's degree in business administration. Uh, I have an undergrad in criminal justice. I have an extensive background in auditing and workflow analysis, and I'm a graduate at the FBI National Academy. Uh, the National Academy is probably one of the most coveted trainings that any law enforcement commander can actually have. Uh, less than 1% of commanders are ever nominated, selected, and complete this training. So I'm proud to share that with you guys today. And then finally, I am also a graduate of San Jose Leadership Class of 2014. Uh, and on my free time, I, I give back to the community. I'm a president of a nonprofit a Vietnamese-based organization known as VASE. It stands for Vietnamese American City Employees. So I do that uh, in addition to my professional uh, community work. So the, the reason why I, I feel that I would be a very strong candidate for chief here in the city of San Jose is I, I believe I can add a lot more value uh, with my time left here in the city. I can help more people. Uh, I believe my knowledge, skills, abilities, education, and accomplishments puts me in a very good position to be one of the key candidates in this selection process. So I'm very proud to be here as one of the finalists and, and humbled to be um, competing with all these fine uh, chiefs and, and deputy chief commanders. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Ta. Appreciate that. Uh, Interim Chief Tyndall, uh, please take three to four minutes and tell the community about yourself and why you wanna be the next 
uh, permanent police chief here in uh, San Jose. Well, good morning, Gary, and good morning to everybody uh, watching here today. Um, I'd first like to say thank you to the city and the city of San Jose and all its res residents for the uh, opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm truly humbled to be considered as your next chief of police. My name is David Tyndall, and I'm the current acting chief for the San Jose Police Department. I was raised in, by a single mom in Glasgow, Scotland, and moved to the United States when I was 14 years old. Uh, I graduated from high school while working 40 hours a week. And I've always had a high, high ethical work standard that have carried me through my teenage years to where I am now. My late teens found me working cleaning pools at a local water park in East San Jose, uh, and I worked there for seven years. The east side of San Jose became my home for almost 10 years as I worked towards what I knew was my dream career in the city of San Jose. My first attempt to get hired at San Jose PD ended because I was not able to obtain my citizenship at that time uh, because my as a resident alien card, as was documented on that card, uh, kind of stipulated that I would not be able to join the PD. I then put myself through the police academy for money I'd earned from jobs while trying to become a citizen. I will say uh, the loves of my life, my life is filled with two very active 14 year olds uh, who are in sports and uh, they share my passion for working and protecting the residents of San Jose with the stories they're told. My experience at San Jose is broad. My time in patrols, patrol always drew me back to the east side where I felt a strong connection with the community. I took assignments in Poco Way, project crackdown areas, including Santee and Washington neighborhoods. I was particularly drawn to the areas where I could interact with some of the most vulnerable neighborhoods who were most victimized by crimes. My work ethic as an officer took me to special operations units like Merge, or that's our own SWAT team, and become a field training officer promoted to work street level gang enforcement, homicide, internal affairs, and ultimately took command positions over investigations, field operations, and now is the acting chief of police. I will say every candidate here has experienced lots of qualifications, uh, belong to many professional organizations, but my experience lead, leading at every level of this police department is the one thing that sets me apart. I'm a proven leader at challenging time when our department needs both stability and undertake a reinvention of ourselves. We have to confront the uncomfortable truths about our profession and yes, here in our own organization. The challenges for our next chief are greater than those in the past. No chief will be successful if our officers do not follow them, believe in our goals and, pro and trust in our leadership. I do know the men and women of this police department and I know that they will follow and lead the way. I know this department and this community and I believe in our ability to meet the expectations this moment because I know the except exceptional capacity and commitment of all of our officers. They have been and will continue to be the reason behind all of our successes. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chief Tyndall, appreciate that. Um, before I get into the, the questions, I'm gonna talk briefly about the top themes from the community survey. Uh, the questions were formulated based on these themes, uh, and they are as follows. Racial equity and systemic racism, quality of life crimes, discipline and accountability, community interaction and outreach, and recruitment and retention. So with that having been said, we are rotating the order of the question. So uh, Chief Dahl, you will be first on the next question which is uh, a racial equity question. How does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? How would you engage in the conversation with the community and police department workforce regarding racial equity work and work of reimagining community safety? And is there anything you would start immediately? Thanks, Gary. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about this. Um, I think that, uh, you know, first, I just want to give a little context. You know, I think sometimes people don't know much about Anchorage. And so um, Anchorage is an incredibly diverse city. We're about 300,000 people. Um, we actually have one of the most diverse census tracts in the country. 
Um, and uh, we have over 100 first languages spoken in our school. So uh, if you're not familiar with Anchorage, we have a lot of diversity here. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that just because we have diversity, it doesn't mean that uh, racism doesn't exist in our community. It's real. We have to acknowledge that. I think as law enforcement executives, it's important to um, to lead the way for the people in our departments in uh, in making that statement and acknowledging that this is a real thing. I think that um, you know this conversation has been happening for a while in our communities, but really, last year George Floyd um, brought that to the forefront for all of us, uh, e even here in Anchorage. And so I think it's just important to start from that context of this is real. The people in our community feel it, and we have to be able to successfully address it. Um, that means uh, engaging in difficult conversations, both inside the police department and with um, uh, the leaders of uh, our community groups, uh, and personally face-to-face -face with people out in our communities. That can be challenging. I I've been doing that here, uh, especially over the course of the last year, as our community has raised these very valid concerns um, engaging in that face-to-face -face, uh, discussion. It's, it's uncomfortable at times, um, it's difficult, but also uh, it's really an opportunity to grow, uh, both personally and professionally. It's an opportunity to uh, show the rest of the people in our departments um, that this is an opportunity to grow for them as well um, and to become better servants of their community. And ultimately, uh, it's, it's an engagement opportunity to help people that are underserved by the police department to be better connected to the department. Um, you know, I, it's, it's a challenge, I think, to talk about this in just three or four minutes because there's so much to talk about. And, uh, and, I, and I actually really enjoy being involved in these discussions with uh, members of the community here in Anchorage. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, really having an understanding about the lack of equitable access to service um, by uh, members of our BIPOC community uh, really is important. And we really can't have an appropriately structured and engaged police department if we're not addressing that. Um, I think that once we begin to uh, engage in that conversation and really to continue to engage in that conversation, you know, I'm fully aware that San Jose uh, police department has been doing the same thing that uh, departments across the country are doing, you know, really leaning into uh, this discussion. You know, you can uh, develop an awareness of your own personal bias and understand the hidden bias that uh, all of us possess at some level um, and how to overcome those things and really uh, and really become, like I said, better servants to your community. You can understand how culture impacts behavior, um, how that has an impact on the way that all of us interact with our community uh, while we're out engaging in law enforcement. And, and ultimately, how cultural awareness can actually uh, help all of us do our jobs as public servants more effectively. Um, you know, discussing the diverse and unique cultures found in all of our communities really strengthens um, you know, our diversity of thought and problem solving as we work to address the things that the com uh, community is concerned about. Um, so, you know, really, I just, I think it's important to acknowledge that we're really at the starting point in a lot of ways. And this um, discussion really has to be ongoing and continuous every day. So thanks, Gary. Thanks, Chief Dahl. Um, Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Mata. Uh, the same question, how does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? How would you engage in that conversation with the community and police department uh, regarding the racial equity work and the work of reimagining community safety? Is there anything you would immediately address? And that's for Deputy Chief Mata. Thank you for the question, Gary. First, I wanna say that any discrimination and harassment will not be tolerated and will be investigated. And if found to be true, will be addressed through existing policies and, and the law. Systemic racism and racial bias impacts policing in a negative way because it affects the community and our workforce. It creates division and us versus them mentality and creates distrust. As an organization, we have to practice fair and impartial policing within the laws. As a chief, I will ensure that all members of the department will treat everyone with dignity and respect, and also create a culture that is welcoming to all. As we just mentioned, 
we have to reconcile and acknowledge our failures as a society and as a profession on the issue of race and the impact it had historically and currently in our communities. We must have these candid conversations and listen to the experiences and trauma that exist and work towards regaining trust and confidence in our communities. I will remove limitations and barriers and create a culture of equity, inclusion, and opportunity for all. When our communities trust and have confidence in us, they will assist us in keeping our communities safe. When our workforce is treated fairly, they are more effective and trust our organization. As the chief, I will expand on the race and equity training we have done on fair and impartial policing, procedural justice, the history of policing, the history of racism, cultural awareness, and provide that training to all members of the department. As part of the city's police reform work plan and through partnership with the city's Office of Racial Equity, we will be participating in racial equity training through the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. This training will be intentional and meaningful in order to change mindsets and behaviors and to help our workforce better understand the bias, racism, and inequity that exists in our society and our profession. We must address and correct these behaviors wherever they exist. Throughout my career, I have developed cultural competency and have shared those experiences with department members. This was possible by developing strong relationships with our diverse communities, such, our, such as our mosques in Evergreen Alviso, the Sikh Gurdwara, Little Saigon, Vietnam Town, and members of our LBGTQ community and workforce. I have also worked and partnered with neighbors that experience racial inequity and have been, that have been impacted by police services such as Cadillac and Winchester, Polk Away, Mayfair, Valley Palms, Washington, Capitol Park, Santee, and Seven Trees. I listened to their concerns and the needs that they required to build trust and confidence in the department while also keeping them safe. I have also worked and partnered with organizations to promote equity, equality, inclusion, such as Aki, NAACP, Silicon Valley Debug, La Raza Roundtable, Amigos de Guadalupe, Somos Wayfair, CARE, PACT, PARS Equity Luna, and Luna, and other nonprofits and schools to discuss department operations, services, and policies and their impact on our community. Through these partnerships, I have been able to identify barriers and limitations and have made the necessary changes through policy and procedures so that we provide just and equitable services. I understand and believe in transparency because it is important for our communities to know how we police them. And by working together, we can make the necessary changes to improve our services. As a chief, I will continue to work with these communities and organizations and, and others to continue our relationship and to develop trust in our department. I will also work within our organization to create a welcoming and inclusive environment so that our workforce feels safe and has a fair and equitable opportunities for advancement. Finally, I strongly believe that by building true relationships, we can align my vision of ensuring that our residents and workforce have the highest trust and confidence in their police department. I will continue to work to improve our organization and it starts with each one of us. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Deputy Chief Mata. Uh, Deputy Chief Randall, same question. How does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? And how would you engage in that conversation with the community, the police department workforce uh, regarding the racial equity work that's ongoing and the work of reimagining community safety? And is there anything you would immediately address? Thank you, Gary, such an important topic. Um, you know, I'll start by talking about how confronting our biases can be the hardest part of this work. I, I think there's this fear that admitting bias is admitting to being racist, but you know, acknowledgement of our bias is where we have to start. And that's a very important first step. Um, if you go back and look at the history of laws in our country, some of those laws were specifically designed to be oppressive of people of color. 
and police us, we were the ones that were enforcing these laws. Um, the other side of this issue is personal bias, and it has nothing to do with law, but it has everything to do with the massive amounts of discretion that we give officers in their everyday tasks and their proactive police work that they do. Um, we also, as a police department, we have addressed crime, we've targeted crime in such a way without considering the wider impacts that it has to communities. And that's something that we need to look at and consider. Uh, this is a system-wide criminal justice issue. And we, the police department, can no longer ignore our role um, in, in contributing to this current situation. Um, but it's important, and, and that engagement piece with the community and the police department is incredibly important as we move forward, especially when it comes to racial equity work and reimagining. Um, we need to educate our workforce on the why, help them understand so that they have that deep understanding of how we contribute to this issue. And we've done that in many ways. And um, Deputy Chief Mata uh, mentioned some of the training that we've done, and I think it's a very important part of this. We need to do an internal examination, um, looking at what we do as an organization, um, what we're doing to contribute, and how our actions have affected people further down the line. So we just need to open up that view and really, and really consider that. We need to conduct outreach. We need to identify how we, how we have impacted the communities. We need to hear from them, what they're feeling. And we need to have officers at the center of that outreach so they can hear directly from our communities and really develop that deep understanding and connection. It's very important. So there's things that I would immediately address in this space. And, and I'm gonna get very specific because I think it's important for our police department. Um, one example of the type of equity work that we need to do is how we currently assign resources. And an example of that would be in our fi financial crimes unit. We have to balance limited resources, as we know, right? Our, our police department has a finite amount of resources. Um, so for these cases, we have to set a dollar threshold. Now, if that dollar threshold is $15,000, that may be a little bit or a lot, and it's dependent upon the person who's been victimized. And we really need to think about that because we don't intend to be inequitable, but in cases like that, we could be, and we're giving our resources and attention to somebody who might be wealthier. And so that's something that we need to kind of peel back the layers and think about um, using our resources equitably across the organization, um, looking at how we serve victims by recognizing the distinct challenges different communities have here in our city. Currently, uh, we have captains who report out on divisional crime and they do that quarterly. Uh, they focus on crime stats, which is important, and we should continue to do that, but we need to think of a way to integrate racial equity into that reporting so that it is woven into everything that we do. It's, it's a very important part as we move forward. And then lastly, we need to embrace the idea of not sending police officers to everything. We need to build in alternatives um, based on what the community wants. We need to ask them, and we need to connect with them and engage our neighborhoods. Um, ask for input, pilot ideas, see if it works, and then come back and get feedback from them. This is an important part. Um, you know, our officers are also asking for alternatives, and we must engage them as well. We're currently piloting a partnership with mental health clinicians um, where sometimes they take the lead on mental health calls. And the feedback that we've had from officers has been tremendous. And so these, these are areas that we need to expand within our police department. But that communication piece, um, soliciting input from all involved will be a key step as we move forward. One reason why it's so hard to change in law enforcement is because we often work in silos. So we need to really think about that. And my role as chief would be to bring everyone together and look at things through an equity lens and engage the entire system. Bring it together, affect change. And then lastly, we need to engage our Office of Racial Equity. Um, really build a culture that puts equity at the forefront of everything that we do. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Randall. Assistant Chief uh, Scarato, um, how does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? How would you engage in this conversation with the community and police department workforce regarding racial equity work and the work of reimagining community safety? And is there anything you would immediately uh, address. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Uh, the follow up on, on Deputy Chief Randall's position, you know, the history of law enforcement back to the Jim Crow era 
of law enforcement where police officers were tasked to be slaves, to handle slaves and, and moving forward and moving on into society as an oppressive entity to control, right? So, so when we think about how systematic racism affects or systemic racism affects law enforcement today, current officers in this era may not be very familiar with how the origin of policing started. But I will assure you that community members are very aware of how they've been treated and, and have a lived experience in that space, in that environment, and that level of trust is diminished because of it. Uh, we talk about inequity. Inequity doesn't just have a, a racial impact. Inequity speaks to religious inequities, uh, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, and, and how they are treated as it relates to overall community Muslim. Uh, you start thinking about these inequities within our, our profession or within our communities, and, and it also needs to be addressed. Sexual orientation, the LGBTQ community, Asian Americans, people of color, people of other, have experienced many inequities and, and oftentimes law enforcement has been the, the entity charged with enforcing that equity. And, and so it is important to recognize that that exists with, within our profession. And as we work hard to eradicate it, the memory of it will always be present for a lot of our community. So how do, how do we engage in that conversation? We, we are open, we are understanding, we address it with honesty that, that we can't use the confines of the insular protection of our organization and, and say we're doing implicit bias training, procedural justice training, and, and never engage the community in a meaningful and impactful way. So thinking of Pittsburgh, we created community procedural justice that where our officers and our community were engaging in the same conversations where they were hearing truths about how the community, specifically communities of color, felt, specifically communities of other felt about policing strategies, policing interactions. Uh, you think of acknowledging that, that we, again, we have not always treated minorities with the level of dignity and respect that they deserve as a profession. And, and, and that's not to cast uh, a, a shadow on our, our noble profession, but it's to cast reality on the way some of our officers interact with those communities of other. So if I was, the things I would do today are the things that I did in Pittsburgh is we start engaging our communities. We start having our officers participate in restorative justice programs, mandating that they engage, but, but for the purpose of gaining understanding, gaining enlightenment, gaining a level of empathy for those that are different than them. Uh, Pittsburgh, we, we partnered with our academic partner, Duquesne University, to create what we called an inside out program and all of our recruits had to go through it. And that was where our, our youngest officers were engaging with those individuals incarcerated to, to, get, to gain and glean understanding of how and why they got there and to have a different perspective. Those programs worked. Uh, we must ensure to close that procedural justice, implicit bias isn't a concept, isn't a training, that it's an education and a practice that's built into the DNA of our officers on an everyday basis to ensure that they are treating our communities with the dignity and respect it deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Scretto. Captain Ta, uh, you're next up on this question. How does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? How would you engage in that conversation with your community and the police department uh, regarding racial equity work and reimagining community safety? And is there anything you'd address immediately? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, this is a, a very, um, difficult discussion to have. I mean, we've had these discussions uh, forever, you know, and, and there, these discussions are not going to go away because that's how critically important they are. So I, I guess the the main answer or question is, does racism exist? Does, does bias exist? And to what level in certain communities does that exist? And I think that uh, from my perspective, it's probably unreasonable to think that simply because you put on a uniform, all of your biases, whether they're implicit or explicit, just go away. So from a command perspective, 
uh, we, we really need to look at data. We need to look at data to see if there are any inherent problems or red flags that we have with relation to detention data, with relation to use of force data, uh, really dissecting uh, it in several different layers, looking at the reasons for stops, what happens during these stops, whether they're searches, what ethnicity uh, these folks are. And these, uh, these data points are then used and analyzed by exterior companies that help us look objectively to see if there are any issues that we need addressed. And when I say issues, th those issues are because as some of the other candidates have just mentioned, uh, some implicit biases are just, just that. They're unconscious. Uh, folks don't even know that they're associating a certain thing with another thing. And to the extent possible that we can train our folks to understand fair and, and impartial policing practices, uh, explicit and implicit biases and tolerance training. So if they don't have in their own personal uh, history of, of cultural, then they can learn about it, you know, learn about other cultures, learn about other religions, learn about other norms, kind of understand what those mean and, and be a little bit more tolerant and respectful for them. So we can do that, but it goes even further. I think that once you start talking about how police officers interrelate with the community, uh, it, it really is where officers have to have either some sort of a personal connection where they have shared experiences and they can relate better, or we do something what, what I would consider calling institutionalized compassionism. And as chief, I would do uh, just that. I would change policies to institutionalize a way where officers consistently contact community. And that could mean that uh, they're assigned a community uh, neighborhood association. They go to that association meeting uh, regularly. They deal with that neighborhood for all kinds of social and crime problems. And they connect with them on positive levels as well as uh, dealing with issues. And so when we create policies where uh, constant, consistent communication happens, that's where friendships get started. That's where relationships get started. That's where partnerships get formed and really problem solving happens. Because once you uh, are a friend to somebody, you, you're gonna go that extra distance normally that you would not go for a stranger. And then let me just really quickly talk about the reimagining of uh, community safety because I'm the lead from San Jose PD. And so that is uh, critically important to that relationship building with the community because as we look at social problems that then turn into crime problems, uh, we have to reimagine upstream holistically how we can address some of these social problems before they become crime problems. But our role as police not always is the enforcer. I think our role is kind of that binding agent that draws people together into these meetings. And we are that person that kind of connects each other to uh, themselves. So that way they, they form that cohesion, they form that friendship, they start becoming more respectful to one another. And some of these problems don't rise to the level where one neighbor calls the police on the other neighbor. And then just as a final thought, Good, Captain Tell, you're, you're at your time, but if you could wrap up, that'd be great. Just a final thought, something I would do immediately is, is once we get officers, where, wherever we get them from with recruitment, we really need to look uh, to see how we develop those officers and those officers uh, that get uh, promotional opportunities, job opportunities, uh, advancement opportunities, they really need to have some sort of variable to see how uh, they add value to the community and how overall they add value to the department. So I think all those those three things really come together uh, to create that um, that synergy that we need for the reimagining of community safety. Thank you. Um, Interim Chief Tyndall, uh, same question. How does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? And how would you engage in that conversation with the community, the department, um, regard and regarding the racial equity work and work of reimagining community safety. Is there anything you'd address immediately? Thanks, Gary. Uh, first and foremost, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that systemic racism exists in our country, period. Uh, I'm not sure how we can say it does not appear in policing or anywhere else when 
you know, I pick up the newspaper and we see it in things like home appraisals and everyday places like a restaurant. Um, I will say that my journey did not begin in this country until I was in my teenage years, but I do see the history of systemic racism and its place in policing. I also know that I need to articulate how I, as a white male, I'm the best person out of this group to move this police department forward. I know that we have to be circumspect in reversing its impact on our commu communities of color. I mean, I will say that when I have my badge pinned to my chest, I, I just can't describe the, the moment of pride I felt. But with that pride, I inherited hundreds of years of, of times of oppressive history by police. We have our own history, including not hiring the first Ameri African American male until 1954 and our first African American female until 1973. Um, I will say there's, there's a reason why distrust exists. And that reason is we can't garner trust without first admitting the prior mistakes and starting conversations without acknowledging our historic and present role in this system. I think the first realism or the first realization is that bias and bigotry exists and it exists here within our own ranks. It existed 26 years ago when I was hired and also existed the last seven years um, under our last two police chiefs, both of who were co of color. But it's not who we are and it's not who we are as a department and I can say out loud, it won't be tolerated under my command. My job as chief needs to help our, or help our officers realize that they do not need to fear addressing racism. Just wearing this uniform nowadays can have you called a racist. Hearing that has its effect on our own officers and even our officers of color. Our department must demonstrate our responsibility to reverse racial inequalities uh, by committing resources towards this work. And doing this, I believe, will make us credible. I intend to create a command position within our department that will lead our racial equity network. I also intend to create an internal task force to work collaboratively with our city, Office of Racial Equity, which you've heard of. That includes our line level officers who will work with our community to examine our practices and policies to see where we can make a difference. I remember working in an area where we towed cars of unlicensed drivers. While this was legally permissible, this absolutely affected our communities of color. And I think about how many families who had a single vehicle that were unable to get to work or take the kids to school because of this very policy. It begs the question, how many other things are there out there that we are doing on autopilot? I believe we need to look inward with purpose and I think we'll discover a lot. I need to ensure that our entire department understands the goal and embraces the notion that good intentions can create unintended results. We need to equip our officers with more alternatives, sorry, uh, for problem solving than just citations and arrests. I believe the reimagining process is where we will achieve success in racial equity, but only if we act boldly and if we try new things. Sharing the responsibility for the safety of our community is the only way to make this math work, and especially in our times with this department and as thinly staffed as we are. Diverting certain calls to community-based organizations, professionals can free officers to respond to more serious crimes and reduce response times. Our men and women are incredible problem solvers, but they have to be given the time to listen. An arrest or citation is not the solution to every single problem that we have here. When we get put in that position, when we force solutions, we're more likely to have conflict with what's going on. I believe we can't just wait for a transformation to happen. We need to actively pursue and facilitate partners in community-based and other government organizations. Building solutions will take hard work and will have its own challenges. I'm proud of the work I have done leading every department, leading our department at every level, operationally, investigatively, and administratively. How I lead this organization in addressing these most pressing issues around race and equity will be amongst the most important work that I've ever done. I do believe, and I truly believe this, the status quo is not an option. Great. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Chief. So next up is uh, Chief Bowers, same question. Um, how does systemic racism and racial bias impact policing? How would you engage in that conversation with the community and the department? Um, and on uh, racial equity work and reimagining community safety? And is there anything you'd do immediately? So thank you, Gary. Um, you know, 
critically important uh, topic uh, that's going to absolutely affect everything that we're doing. You know, first and foremost, uh, racial bias uh, just fundamentally flat out, it destroys the existing trust and legitimacy that the public has in policing, um, period. And uh, systemic racism um, left unchecked, um, it's, it, it limits uh, our abilities to collectively uh, change and move uh, to more equitable policing, uh, flat out. You know, if we think we're gonna make some tweaks and changes, uh, provide some training and not address the structural things that exist, uh, we're not going to get to where we need to be. And that's, and, that's, and that's the issue with structural racism. We can address racial bias, uh, and we have addressed it. We've, we've heard about how we've addressed it. We've addressed it through uh, hiring a diverse workforce uh, with all the training that we've all done, we've all implemented in our departments, you know, implementing 21st century in policing. Uh, we've done those things. Um, but we need to look at, we need to look at um, the systems that are in place. Uh, we need to look at the culture in our organization. We need to look at the societal uh, cultures and systems that are in place. And, we, and it's gonna require us to do something that's very difficult, uh, which is challenge our assumptions. Um, we need to not only understand uh, the history of policing uh, from the standpoint of you know, the, the tough history with race, but we need to engage in reconciliation to understand the linkage to current day happenings uh, that, that are going on. Um, regarding engaging in the conversations with the community uh, in the police department, um, I believe that it's gonna be important uh, to acknowledge I, I just you got to be real with this. You know, not everybody is in the same place with regard to these conversations, whether it's in the community or in the police department. Um, and so that said, that's why we need to ensure that our culture within the organization, that we're doing things, uh, that we're going to be able to build resilience. Change is hard. Change is difficult. It's not easy. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, and we need to really build a culture where we, we can become comfortable being uncomfortable. We need to be able to exist in those uncomfortable spaces. Uh, in Piedmont, um, you know, I'll, I'll be blunt, after the murder of George Floyd, um, I went to each briefing and I had a, a heartfelt conversation uh, with the men and women of my organization. Um, and, and again, it was very blunt. I, and, and I just, I, I, on the outside, I just said, hey, if, if, if you watch that video and you can rationalize anything that you saw, what I need you to do is go put your badge, your gun, your point ID on my desk and walk. Fortunately, nobody obviously did that. Um, but the, the fact is, is that, you know, we needed to have conversations about change and, we, and about the changes that are coming. You know, we talk, I talked to my department about the fact that, um, you know, again, it, there was gonna be a lot of change that was gonna be on the way, it was gonna be difficult. Uh, and the fact that we needed to be open to having those hard conversations and the fact that I was gonna be supporting them in those efforts. I, look, I looked at them and called upon them to look at what they've done with pride in terms of already engaging in that work uh, of being more resilient, of going through the training, of challenging our assumptions. Um, and we directed uh, resiliency training for the entire department because as a chief, I understand uh, and, and understood the importance of cultivating an environment where we're capable of dealing with the change in, a, in as constructive way as possible. Um, I would immediately address uh, as things as far as I would immediately do, um, I would immediately address the work of the police reform plan. Uh, specifically, uh, I would talk about the need uh, that we need to be thoughtful and intentional, uh, not only with the outcomes and where we're trying to get to, but we need to make sure that the process, um, and uh, we, need to, we need to make sure and be mindful about the process and be very intentional with that process. We need to be very communicative with the community and the women and men of the police department. Um, so I would engage in that conversation with the department and community, and community uh, by ensuring uh, that we construct a communications plan uh, in collaboration with the city manager's office based on being inclusive, based on making sure that we're listening to everybody, uh, that we're educating folks, and also explaining the changes to the rank and file and the community so that they don't hear about it through the media or in a memo, but that they have inclusion in the process. So communication is the key to this endeavor. And, and we need to make sure that it's timely and that it's accurate. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. Okay, so we got through one question and we're uh, at an hour and 10 minutes. So I'm gonna ask everyone to try and stay, um, keep it to three to four minutes and not go over. I'm gonna cut you guys off. So appreciate that. Um, next question relates to quality of life crimes. And we're gonna start with Deputy Chief Mata. Uh, many of our residents express frustration with the perception that quality of life crimes such as property theft and vandalism 
are not prioritized as other crime in San Jose. How would you re pri sorry, pri prioritize calls and balance conflicting priorities when resources are strained? Thank you, Gary. Let me start by saying that our men and women, both sworn and civilian, do an amazing job of keeping our community safe. I'm extremely grateful to work with a very dedicated and passionate workforce that will continue to support the great work that they do. As mentioned, we have a very limited, we have very limited resources and staffing is one of them. Being the 10th largest city in the nation, we are the most thinly staffed police department with only 1,150 officers for over 1 million people. That is down from almost 1,400 in 2008. Increasing our workforce will be a priority of mine but we also have to be more effective by holding our workforce accountable. Currently, our profession is undergoing some changes and our department is no different. We are currently working on our police reforms under the reimagining public safety framework. As part of those conversations, we are looking at the types of service calls that may be better handled by other agencies because we know that not every call requires a police response. This is one way to create efficiency. I understand the frustration of our residents as I too was a victim of a vehicle break-in several years ago and had to wait for a police response. We must close that gap in our service so that our communities feel safe and continue to have confidence and trust in our department. That will be accomplished through better service and additional staffing and resources. All crimes are a priority with violent crime and the preservation of life being the first priority. Property crimes greatly outpace violent crimes because there are more opportunities for individuals to victimize others through property. Ev Evidence-based research has shown that the drivers of crime are gangs, guns, and drugs. So we must address those drivers as well to reduce all crime. Also, California had a major correctional realignment reform. In 2014, Proposition 14, 47 was passed, which reduced penalties for many property and drug offenses. I mentioned this because law enforcement is just one part of addressing property crime. The criminal justice system needs better alternatives to hold those committing property crimes responsible. And the community and their police department has to have to work as partners and be part of those conversations. In addition to the reduction in penalties, other factors also come into play, such as the current pandemic and the economic downturn. This has caused some to turn to property crime. As a result, we are challenged in addressing these crimes. During the pandemic, we are seeing a decrease in theft and a decrease in residential burglaries. However, we are seeing an increase in commercial and school burglaries and auto theft. In order to address property crimes, we have to partner with residents and businesses to provide education on how to lessen the risk of victimization. Second, to ensure community engagement by reporting crimes, creating awareness through neighborhood and business watch programs. And finally, through prevention by increased police visibility and better response, and also through env environmental design, such as increased lighting and surveillance cameras and other technologies. We have seen these successes in other communities when they deploy these strategies. During my time as a captain in the Foothill Division, I deployed these strategies and they were successful. Great. So thank you, thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Mata. Uh, same question for Deputy Chief Randall. Um, many of our residents expressed frustration over the perception of quality of life crimes, such as property theft and vandalism. Um, how would you prioritize the calls and balance the conflicting priorities when resources are strained? Thank you. Well, we are beyond knowing that we can arrest our way out of these types of problems, uh, but we can't ignore them either. Uh, we need to think differently about how we approach them and, and looking at root causes and focus on frequent offenders. Um, that's where we're going to gain ground. Um, maintaining our priority of 
um, using resources first for serious crime and violence. This is something that I would continue and something that we have been successful at. Um, and these are examples of where uh, sending a police, not sending a police officer isn't an option. We need officers to go to those calls. It's very important. But it, when it comes to crime like property crime, we know that one person is usually responsible for a whole bunch of crime. Um, we need to identify and we need to target these chronic offenders that are causing a disproportionate amount of crime. And we do this with more serious crimes and we've been successful, uh, but that same strategy can be used here as well. Um, collaboration is gonna be so incredibly important. Um, again, we know that we have limited resources, um, but to have an impact on quality of life crimes like property crimes, we must have a shared responsibility, a partnership in how we respond. We need to integrate community partners um, into every element of the strategy to share that responsibility. Once we identify those frequent repeat offenders, we need to collaborate with our city attorney, district attorney, and service providers and come up with solutions and strategies that will decrease the likelihood of those individuals committing more crime. It's um, really about that focus type of policing. And we know that there's a lot of intersectionality with other things like mental illness, narcotic addiction, alcohol addiction. So we need to engage the county service provi providers and most certainly the community um, to come up with solutions. So root causes, causes of crime can be addressed. It's important that we don't ignore those things. Um, this reimagining process, this is gonna help free up time for our officers to address our part of the solutions and provide officers with the ability to be proactive in those areas. This is also an area where technology can help, can help us be more efficient with our time. Everyday tasks like filling out forms, maybe it's a tow form, whatever it may be, but those tasks can be improved and we can be more efficient and um, that will free up time for our officers. Uh, we also need to examine calls for service we should not be responding to as part of that reimagining process and instead have people that are specifically trained for these instances, thereby, again, freeing up time for our officers to respond to calls with a criminal component. We've already started this with our mental health response um, in cooperation with the county as a first step. The next steps are full integration and diversion of some calls entirely. And that's when we're gonna see those net gains. And we've seen this in other cities and it's been successful, but this evolution, it's gonna take time because the systems do not currently exist. Uh, but we, the police department, we can help drive the adoption models that include both our county partners and our community-based organizations. So like I said, there have been successes in other police departments um, where they've been able to divert these low-level crimes, not just mental health. So we need to widen our view and really look and see what's out there. Uh, we need to find other areas within our organization that can help, that can be handled by other entities, service providers or experts who are better able to address the needs of the community. I know that quality of life in every neighborhood in the city is a concern and it can't be ignored. We can make improvements to the current situation and I'm committed to doing that. Great, thank you, Chief, appreciate it. Uh, Assistant Chief Scarato, same question. Uh, many of the residents in San Jose expressed frustration with the perception of quality of life crimes, property theft and vandalism particularly, that they're not prioritized. How would you prioritize calls and balance conflicting priorities when resources are strained? So I don't believe that communities, any community in San Jose is going to dispute that violent crime should take priority over quality of life. What I do think they dispute is that their priorities are not the police department's priorities. They're not the organization's priorities. What they dispute is that as a chief, as the chief, my responsibility is to listen to what the community thinks is important to them. That, that, that tenant in 21st century policing called community policing and problem solving. Uh, this thing, we spend, study show, we spend about 35% of our response time on calls like parking complaints. Uh, burglar alarms, especially most oftentimes false burglar alarms, uh, traffic accidents where there's no injury. And, and in Pittsburgh, what we did was we prioritized it, that and separated it from our organizational response. And that provided a third more time for our officers to focus on quality of life issues. Uh, the communities aren't, aren't 
challenging us as it relates to priority. They're challenging us as it relates to their involvement with how we prioritize crime. I, we created a quality of life of patrol when I was in my, as a commander in zone three. And, and that was taking our 13 neighborhoods and creating a public safety council, which would in turn advise us what was a priority to each of their individual neighborhoods. And it's very different than me telling them what should be their priority. And, and when we did that in community engagement increased, satisfaction with response increased, and oftentimes we diminish the, the level of, uh, of unhappiness that, that the community felt with the organization. And it was because we involved them from the beginning. You know, when, I, when we have a commander's meeting, a district commander showed up at the community meeting with an officer that was patrolling that sector with the community resource officer and, and we provided and listened to to their concerns and and when we did that we created a, a collaborative uh a collaborative approach to resolving whatever specific issue most oftentimes it would rather be theft uh vandalism loitering you know the same calls the, those quality of life calls don't exist don't aren't specific and distinct to san jose they exist everywhere in america the reality of it is how do you respond to it uh initially you have to improve community police partnerships with collaborative with collaborative problem solving creativity is, is a key i mean just think apple the campus uh, apple's campus isn't the only place there's creativity our officers are very uh are, are very resourceful provided with what they are given. And, and in this instance, we allow our officers the autonomy to, to problem solve with the communities in which they're responsible for. We created a virtual block watch, one of the first in the country. And that was partnering with community, business leaders, and our officers to, to purchase cameras, residential and business, place some strategic locations in a neighborhood where we could monitor as as the police the community could monitor the business could monitor and we publicize it signs everywhere uh and what we saw we evaluated that process for six months now, and i think this is the true collaborative policing effort and we decreased part one crimes by 65 percent in six months by partnering and, and when we were done we continued that partnership and expanded it to the to the larger zone and then continuing to expand it citywide so i think if we are if we are listening as as an administration then we are taking into account what the community is saying to us and then acting on their priorities and not ours great thank you thank you chief appreciate it uh, captain ta same question um residents are expressing frustration with the perception of quality of life crimes such as property theft and vandalism uh, are not prioritized as other crimes in san jose how would you prioritize calls and balance the conflicting priorities when resources are strained Thank you, Gary. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a tricky topic too because we are a very thin police department and we do run very efficiently. Uh, we got to figure out though how to do it a little bit more efficient. So, from my experience, there um, there really isn't a way to not deal with violence or major injuries uh, when they erupt in this in the community. And so, those core services need to be handled in the way that we handle them currently because those folks really need help right away. What I do see though, is that a lot of the other quality of life calls do come in on the same times, on the weekends uh, and the evening hours. Um, let me give an example with sideshows. Sideshows have been a reoccurring problem that erupts every single weekend. And sometimes we have resources to deal with them, but sometimes we don't. And so we've kind of been very creative about how we address it and innovative in the sense that if we can't address it that evening, then we do some sort of proactive uh, patrolling uh, the next day or follow up. So we'll go out the next day, we'll get a vehicle impound seizure warrant, and then we'll go collect those cars and deal with that problem when our staffing levels are higher and our call levels are lower. And so we can address some of these issues collectively to then have an impact on uh, the behavior as it relates to uh, the weekends when we're the most strained. So uh, I would say as chief, I'd continue to use that same strategy on all levels, looking at what some of these root causes are. We, we could trace them back to a time or a, a day that we have more staffing available to address these issues. 
then we can attack them on multiple uh, fronts. Um, what I do, and, and I had talked about it earlier, was what I do really truly believe is that one beat officer or one team can really significantly help a neighborhood. And mm -hmm. I just wanna reaffirm this theme that when we are able to connect officers to their communities and they develop those friendships, those relationships, they uh, can talk to one another, they feel comfortable calling each other. Uh, that's where a lot of quality of life issues I see are resolved not even at a, a crime level. It's again, where you bring in communities together, they're meeting the officer, but more importantly, they're meeting each other. So they're more respectful with one another. Uh, some of the, the issues that happen with parking or garbage complaints or noise complaints, uh, you'd be amazed that they get solved when you start realizing who your neighbors are and they didn't even realize that their son or daughter, or even themselves were causing you this type of, of um, uh, of problems. And so some of those things there is it's about community and it's about connecting communities and it's not necessarily about policing. Great. Thank you, Captain Toth. Appreciate it. Okay, next, uh, uh, Interim Chief Tyndall, same question. Do you need it read for you again? Or do you have it? Nope, I wrote it down, Gary. Hopefully right. I got it all. Perfect. All right, thanks, Gary. Um, I will say as the current acting chief and the prior chief of field operations, which is where uh, Deputy Chief Randall is now, I know there is nothing more pressing um, and prevalent than our quality of life crimes with our community. I will say it's not only local, but it's national um, when you hear about all the things that are going on. Violent crime and taking guns off our street is always gonna be our number one priority. In fact, many of the crimes that includes homicides and aggravated assaults are up in San Jose in double digit percentiles. And even gun seizures this year um, across the border up a troubling 49%. And this year alone, and this was during a global pandemic. And I expect this year could conceivably be more. We cannot stop our work here. But if there's one thing that I've heard in every single rank that I've worked at in this police department at every community meeting is that our residents are unhappy. And we need to understand that we just can't ignore the fact of what is impacting our residents the most. We must also realize, and Deputy Chief Mata said, you know, the person that has their car broken into is experienced their own forms of evasive trauma. They feel violated, they feel scared, and they feel that crime uh, that they're reporting is important to them and it should be important to us. I mean, how do you tell a single mom who uh, has to get up for work in the morning, um, who's got kids asleep, that the drunken males in the corner that are keeping up is not important? How do you tell the residents impacted by street racing and sideshows, which are all over the place right now in San Jose, that we have other priority calls to get to? We have to acknowledge the fact that the car or the RV outside of somebody's home may be somebody else's home, just trying to survive. I would say that these answers are not only complex, it pulls or should pull um, on the heartstrings of every resident in our city, whether you're housed or unhoused, employed or unemployed. Our residents should not be in fear of street racers or sideshows terrorizing um, and should have solace, quite frankly, that when they call 911, an officer is actually going to show up. No response of, well, there's nothing that we can do about it. That's not acceptable and it's not who we are. We need our, our officers to be acceptable, uh, not only be acceptable, but need to provide them with a variety of solutions um, for issues that are not going away. Besides priorities like redistricting, so that the call volume and response is equally spread throughout our city, we must get back to the basics. We know that foot patrols can accomplish many things in addressing quality of life crimes, but more importantly, they build relationships. Their presence, familiarity with trust they gain in their neighborhood helps deter crimes, often without taking any type of enforcement action whatsoever. I intend to deploy community crime cars that fall under the direct purview of the division captain. These multi-purpose cars can be used for individual issues specific to that geographic area, whether it be public intoxication, vandalism, drugs, speeding, sideshows, all can be targeted by the special community-based patrol team who the community will get to know. I would like to create an accountability loop and when I say that, a, the, the resident gets a direct response from the police department. It may be a sergeant, 
It may be a civilian employee through dispatch. It may be through records. It may be an email. Um, but it needs to be something that closes that loop. And I will say, being in the middle of Silicon Valley, we have got to leverage the technology that we have in this valley, like camera systems to not only capture the crime when no one was looking, but prevent the crime in the first place. You got about 15 seconds, Chief. Okay, lastly, addressing most low-level crimes should include the community through public and private partnerships. This is how it was done during crackdown projects, and this is the way we must get back. I've begun and fully intend to explore true collaborative partnerships in every community with all of our many stakeholders and many measurable improvements to San Jose quality of life. But the truth, quite frankly, is we cannot do this alone. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, Chief Bowers, uh, same question. Uh, many of the residents have expressed frustration with the perception of quality of life crimes, such as property theft and vandalism, uh, because they're not, not prioritized as other crimes. Um, how would you prioritize the calls and balance the conflicting priorities when resources are strained? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Gary. So obviously we, we know where San Jose sits in terms of its staffing levels and the challenges uh, that, that, that that presents. Um, listen, uh, I get it. I get the frustration uh, that folks have uh, with these quality of life issues. Uh, you know, I get the frustration of coming back to your car uh, after going shopping and having your windows smashed out or coming home from uh, you know, an outing and having your home broken into. Um, I get that frustration because I've dealt with it um, as a former resident of San Jose and as a visitor. Um, so I, I, I understand those frustrations. Um, this gets down to responsiveness and this gets down to the organization's credibility. Uh, you know, recently it was publicized uh, that the department's response to priority two calls, um, a, category, a category which includes uh, some of these quality of life crimes uh, was not hitting its response time goals. Uh, first and foremost, um, and several of the other candidates hit on it, but I would convene um, a work group uh, to get together uh, specifically to look at this issue, to look at our responsiveness. The group would be charged with assessing our resource allocations. You know, uh, Acting Chief Tyndall addressed it with, in terms of redistricting and how we're allocating our resources, uh, looking at our priority dispatching, uh, it, the capability of it, um, and its performance, uh, looking at the viability of leveraging uh, other assets um, and abilities, you know, community service officers, uh, technology. Um, in Piedmont, I've rolled out one of the most technological advanced uh, departments in the county with uh, automated license plate readers and surveillance cameras. And we leverage that not only in an investigative standpoint, but to proximately affect crime. And we've integrated that and significantly impacted crime. So I would look at all those things, um, and, and not only from a response standpoint of, of getting out there uh, to calls for service, but also uh, from the standpoint of an investigations and following up with people. Um, again, one of the things, we know how thinly staffed San Jose is. Uh, I'm not gonna beat that drum anymore, but the bottom line is being a chief in a smaller agency, one thing that, I've, that has become crystal clear to me, um, and that's um, you need to have partnerships. You need to leverage your, you need to be collaborative and leverage those partnerships. And so one of the things I would do coming into San Jose as the chief is to assess how we are leveraging our partnerships truly with our other community-based organizations, other stakeholders throughout the community, um, and as well as our, our partners, uh, our, our law enforcement partners throughout the county. Um, we have to be collaborative with this. Um, and we need to get the word out, listen, you know, we can have all the stats in the world. We can throw out everything we want, but at the end of the day, perception's reality. And so we need to get to the point when we're highlighting, I know the women and men of the San Jose Police Department are working their tails off. Um, I know that they're making impacts every single day. And we need to ensure as an organization that we're highlighting their work. Um, because again, perception is reality. Um, just as much as we put out that, you know, the, the guns were taken off the street and the uh, events we're going to, we need to put out how we're impacting those quality of life crimes as well and be very intentional and deliberative with that. Uh, this is, as has been talked about, obviously we're in the, this is an opportunity with, a, um, with the reimagining public safety um, and uh, having an opportunity by allowing us to free up the officers um, in terms of their time with responding to certain types of calls, whether it's mental health issues, uh, those issues dealing with the um, pertain to the unhoused, uh, where there may be a, a better or different option to allow our women and men uh, to free them up to be able to respond to those quality of life uh, issues. But make no mistake about this, this is absolutely about our credibility. 
and about our responsiveness to the community when they call. Um, of course, we're gonna prioritize violent crime and taking guns off the street, absolutely. And I think the community obviously wants that as well, but we can't be unresponsive with the quality of life crimes. Again, because that affects our credibility with the community. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chief, appreciate it. Uh, Chief Dahl, same question um, related to quality of life crimes and, and how you would prioritize calls and balance the conflicting priorities when the resources are strained there in San Jose. Thanks, Gary. And I, for my part, at least, I'm more than willing to waive the reading of the questions. I know we're a little pressed for time. Yeah, so at least sure. for me, I'm, I'm good. I've got them here. But, uh, you yeah. know, this, this question really resonates with me. Um, when I took over as chief uh, in 2017 here in Anchorage, there was a community-wide sentiment that um, crime was out of control. We had a record number of homicides that year, uh, but we also had a record number of stolen vehicles. Uh, it was up like um, 10 times what it had been just a few years previously. And uh, in every community group that I met with talked to me about quality of life issues uh, inside their neighborhood. Uh, you know, things that law enforcement views as relatively low level thefts, but are hugely impactful, um, especially to uh, low income families. And so we heard it over and over again everywhere we went. Um, and we really had to kind of take a step back. Um, it's, I think, easy for law enforcement to lose focus on, uh, on some of these lower level property crimes uh, because we are really focused on violent crime, you know, homicide, sex assault, domestic violence in our community, um, but we really can't ignore these things. And so as an organization and as, as the chief of uh, the police department, I really had to take a step back and think about what can we do to reimagine public safety? How can we leverage the resources we have uh, to make an impact here? You know, Anchorage is very much like San Jose. Um, we are very thinly staffed for the size of our city. Um, we lost a lot of uh, officers uh, in a very short time period and we had to rebuild. And at the same time that we were re uh, doing that rebuild, we had to address this, uh, this huge increase in violent crime and really an overall lack of safety or feeling of safety that the community was experiencing. Um, we've successfully done that over the last four years. Uh, homicides are down by about 50%. Um, we've seen year over year reductions in uh, property crime. Um, we've had substantial uh, reduction in, in property crime just in the last year. Uh, you know, when other cities were seeing increases in, uh, in crime during the pandemic, um, you know, we actually had uh, the police executive research forum reach out to us to try to find out what we're doing differently because we're, we're experiencing something totally different. Um, part of that is, uh, you know, leveraging the resources you have, uh, being as efficient as you can possibly be, but also uh, leveraging the partnerships that exist in any police department, both with your, uh, your prosecutors, uh, your uh, state and federal partners surrounding uh, law enforcement entities, uh, and the community itself. The community has to participate in this kind of uh, challenge. And, uh, and as many of the other speakers have uh, noted, you have to have that community engagement at the officer level, neighborhood by neighborhood in order to address this. When you build those relationships um, between your line officers, uh, you know, you have an officer that's assigned to a beat and she gets to engage with um, the community, learn who the people are, what the problems are, um, and take personal ownership of, uh, of those issues. That's how you make an impact. So, um, you know, it really is more than crime stats. You know, we, we love to look at our data and have hotspot policing and try to figure out where things are happening. Um, but I think sometimes the feeling of safety that's critical for all of our residents and all of our neighborhoods to have gets lost in that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd really be excited to have an opportunity to come to San Jose and just bring some of my perspectives on that and, and look to see, you know, what can we do with the good things that San Jose is already doing, leverage those to, to uh, in, in my experience here in Anchorage to, to make those improvements. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Um, the next question addresses community concerns around discipline and accountability. And we'll start with Deputy Chief Randall. Um, how do you view the role of the Chief of Police in the disciplinary, disciplinary process? And how would you hold your officers and employees accountable for actions taken that do not uphold the public trust? And how would you encourage officers to come forward uh, regarding their concerns uh, with fellow officers? Thank you, Gary. Um, you know, the Chief sets the standard for the organization. 
um, ultimately makes the final decision in discipline. My role as chief would be to ensure that there's a fair process for officers who do a very difficult job. Um, there will be difficult, difficult decisions to be made. I've been a part of those decisions and trust me, we lose sleep over it at times, but the trust of our community and the trust of our rank and file can hang in the balance if the chief doesn't make those difficult decisions. And that includes standing up for officers who are you know, doing the right thing in difficult situations, but also holding them accountable when they engage in misconduct. And I, I am prepared to do both. Accountability and trust in policing is everything. And, and we need that, we need that public trust. And the community, you know, they've, they've told us at times that they don't feel the police can police themselves. Um, so it's important for us to let the community know what behaviors will not be tolerated. Um, let them know that we will take swift action uh, when needed, uh, but we also need to explain our decisions and be as transparent as possible. We need to let them know about what has happened and why we came to a decision, even when they disagree with us. It's very important. When the chief makes decisions like that, difficult decisions, everybody involved is, is considered. The community, their perception, but also every officer in this department who is doing the right thing day in and day out, we have to consider them too, because they're the ones going out into the community and having those interactions. We want our officers, our women and our men to feel comfortable coming forward. Um, very soon, and we're working on this right now, we're gonna be publishing discipline so everyone has an idea. We wanna be as transparent as possible with our rank and file so they know what has occurred, so they understand what behaviors will not be tolerated. In the past, this was always kind of done in secret, um, yet we expect them to know what the standard was. And we need to move away from this. We need to think about transparency for a rank and file, just as we do for the community. It's very important. And when you have an environment of openness and a pathway to express concerns, our officers will come forward and they will tell us about things that they don't think are appropriate. And we need to make sure, and we need to look at the systems we have in place for them to anonymously report things. Um, we should engage our officers. We need to ask them, um, is this a sufficient mechanism? And I would expect that through that conversation, we'll need to craft or update a method um, that's based on feedback from our officers and address their concerns around reporting what they see. We wanna make sure they have those avenues. But it's important to be transparent and fair for both the officers and the communities. It's extremely important. And I'm, I'm committed to working towards improving our disciplinary process. Um, so both our officers and the community will trust that process. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, Assistant Chief Scarato, same question. How do you view the role of the, the Chief of Police in the disciplinary process? And how would you hold your officers and employees accountable for actions taken that do not uphold the public trust? And how would you encourage officers to come forward uh, with concerns regarding officers? Uh, the chief of police sets the standard for the organization. Uh, that is very clear. And we must be fair. We must be impartial. We must be consistent and transparent, not only transparent to the officers, and the organizations, but transparent to our communities. Pittsburgh has been publishing its discipline, disciplinary actions and findings for the last four years as it relates to officer discipline in an effort to ensure we are keeping our community informed about how we handle uh, issues with officers, behavioral issues, and such. Uh, I think it's important to, to recognize our officers do a great job a majority of the time, and they will make mistakes. And there is a difference between making a mistake of the mind and a mistake of the heart. If I forget to write a, a, a number, if I back into a car, if I forget to show, if I forget to set my alarm and I'm late for work, those are all mistakes of the mind. Mistakes of the heart are when I know it's wrong and I do it anyway with disregard to how it affects our profession and our organization. And, and unfortunately, I was in a situation tasked with arresting one of my officers for a mistake of the mind or a mistake of the heart. He was caught on camera bullying a teen and unfortunately for him, Fortunately for us, we captured that data and we took action to set an example, one for what is right and just, uh, that no officer is, is ever going to be above and beyond the profession 
and or the organization and that that in aberrant behavior immoral unethical unlawful behavior will be punished severely uh and and that officer spent two years in federal prison and was just recently released because of that behavior and, and i challenge all of my contemporary to be resolute in that same position of holding our organization accountable when they make mistakes of the heart uh mayor licardo manager sykes and president kelly have agreed on the use of or the uh, using giving more authority to the internal auditor and in pittsburgh uh, we've lived under uh civilian review for the majority of my existence from the federal consent decree in 1997 to the advent of our civilian review board to the office of municipal investigations which acts as our internal affairs so we haven't had a a, a hold or a, a, a we haven't treated discipline insular within the organization we have always had community input community engagement and then all thus community accountability based on how we investigate our own organization based on how we treat disciplinary issues with with officers that relates to community com complaints and excessive force as such so i think it's important that that we work to to build upon those uh we 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 support and 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 um, I think it's important that we also want to have substantial citizen involvement in, in the manner in which we handle disciplinary action against our officers purely from to, from a standpoint of that we we are as transparent as possible to both the organization and the community. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, Captain Ta, same question. You need it? No, I, I have it, Gary. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my opinion is is uh, very similar. I mean, I, I believe that a organization that has high standards and a high level of discipline is is one that's that has a lot of morale and a high level of productivity. By and large, most police departments and certainly San Jose, uh, our officers do a very good job day in and day out. Uh, they do what's right by the community. Uh, oftentimes, they they don't get recognized for it and. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, as humans, we make mistakes as people and and so do our officers. And when that does happen and when there is a misconduct investigation or some sort of complaint, uh, my role as chief, especially if that complaint is of a severe magnitude where it is is really a significant in, uh, incident where public trust and uh, community trust are at the forefront of this kind of this topic. Uh, my responsibility is to make sure that that investigation is investigated in a very expeditious way. And I don't mean that I would have it rushed uh, where it's not done correctly, but we've, we need to put it uh, with the priority that it deserves. It needs to be investigated very, very thoroughly, but in a very timely way so that everybody involved, whether it's the officer, another citizen, the department or the community, uh, we get some resolution and we get some closure and with that resolution that closure it could be an exoneration it could be um, a complaint that's sustained where the officer gets some either positive discipline in the way of training or negative discipline in the way of suspension termination or even criminal conduct so those are the things i believe that um, sometimes rub the community wrong when it the appearance is that it's it's being drawn out uh, too long. So to the extent possible as chief, I would make sure these investigations are conducted in a, a very uh, quick and thorough manner so that way we can get some resolution. Uh, as it relates to people coming forward, uh, this is a, a situation that sometimes is being referred to as ethical amnesia. And it's, it's a difficult thing because it's a culture change. And when you're dealing with police and having somebody to intervene or to, or to come forward to say something, particularly when it involves a senior officer or perhaps even a supervisor, that's going to be uh, easier said than done. Uh, but it has been done. And I'm gonna point to a program called ABLE, which stands for Active by, by, by Standardship for Law Enforcement. And what ABLE does, it, it actually, changes the culture by replacing it with another culture. 
It's a deliberate training where officers go through scenario-based role-playing uh, training. They put them in that environment to see how they feel uh, when that situation is occurring, but more importantly, to see how they feel after they do the right thing. And it reinforces that. It really constructs a, uh, a change of culture and a change of environment where it's reinforced with our staff. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Captain Ta. Uh, Chief Tyndall, same question. Thanks, Gary. Um, so let me first start by saying that as leader, as the current leader of this organization, I'm the one responsible. I'm the one who has to be accountable, and I'm the one who answers to the community, to not only who I serve, but each and every one of us serve. Um, I will say that I've worked in internal affairs, um, and as a leader and commander of many units and bureaus, uh, here at the police department. Um, I've held officers responsible and have disciplined them and even fired them. Uh, and those are the ones that chose themselves over our community and this police department. I think one thing that we need to keep perspective and I'll expand on it a little bit, but last year the San Jose Police Department received over 1 million calls for service uh, through our 911 center. And uh, we were not in over 400,000 different contacts, many of which had multiple officers. From this, we received a little over 200 actual complaints and we self-initiated about 50 internal complaints from inside. And I know that this metric alone can't, and it doesn't capture every aspect of, of what has truly happened in the streets, but I do have to say that the number does tell me that we have a, de a dedicated and a professional police department that I would match towards any other agency anywhere in the nation. I think the question for us should not be, you know, not only be how we keep bad actors out, I think the real question is how do we identify bad actors from within? Uh, you know, unfortunately, incidents like George Floyd's murder and others like this mar the public trust in us. Um, but I will tell you this, I will continue to push for changes in arbitration so that we can get transparency and accountability if my decision is overturned to fire an officer. Um, I've seen actions of a few here that are inexcusable, and as chief of police, my actions have to be able to create a culture and an environment where officers feel comfortable about saying something and saying something to somebody. Culture, cu culture change includes diverse recruiting and promotion and actions like the LGBTQ policy uh, that I just signed just last week. But most importantly, it falls in fostering the safe haven to speak and be heard. I believe in honesty and clear expectations and creating internal procedural justice that are key to creating an effective discipline process. I will be direct in what the expectations are, and that does not just apply to tactics, that applies to how you interact with the public. We truly need to get back to a customer-based approach and that the, that the community is our customer. I will make it clear that your public actions off duty, including social media, must reflect the values of our police department, period. I'm a big proponent of training and I believe we need to retrain our officers in every rank on what the discipline process is all about and what the expectations should be. We have to build a process so that every officer knows that if they face this discipline, it will be fair and consistent and absent politics or favoritism. Finally, we must set our expectation that our officers have a duty to report misconduct and not just in the use of force or they too will face discipline. We need to have more accountability for supervisors who have failed in their roles and as leaders when they have failed and contributed to this failure. And one thing I will say is the fact, one thing I'd, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say is the fact that we have to recognize the fact that our police officers face on the job trauma every day they go to work. They're exposed to unthinkable scenes and situations that undoubtedly affect them in many ways that we can't see. I know for a fact that relationships are caused, you know, whether it be from a family relationship, whether it be um, on how they interact with the residents on our seats, uh, on our streets. And I think that's kind of one of those things that we need to continue to assess them, not only for themselves, but for the community. Our men and women need to know that they're valued and important, but they also need to know that if they make a mistake, they'll be treated fairly. Our system must be trusted by our officers and it has to be trusted by our community. And I think all too often uh, that just, they, they don't align. 
I think if the community feels that, that if the, the community and the officer feels that the process is, is fair, then I think we can come to eventually uh, meeting in the middle of the road and coming together. Great. Thank you, Gary. That's all I have. Thanks, Chief. Chief Bowers, same Good. question. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Um, as it's been said, uh, my role as my, my role as the chief uh, starts with me uh, in making sure that our process is, is really three things, that our, our disciplinary process is three things. It's fair, it's clear, and it's efficient. Um, and, and that's beneficial for the public and, and, and for our, our department members. Um, so I view my role uh, as setting a tone uh, for the organization and, de and delivering a very uh, clear message. Uh, quite frankly, that actions that don't uphold the public trust uh, are not going to be tolerated, um, and they're going to be addressed. Um, so here's the deal. I mean, the women and men of the San Jose Police Department are good, incredibly hardworking people, uh, and they're human beings uh, who make mistakes, and they're imperfect. Um, I believe that discipline should first and foremost be about correcting behavior, and it's not just about being punitive. And so it's important that, you know, we always ask ourselves, and that as the chief, I ask myself the question of, is this issue a, mis is this a mistake? or is this misconduct? Uh, both will be addressed, um, and I, I, can, I can assure you that should misconduct of such a nature uh, that it shakes the public trust to the core of our, uh, of our foundation, um, you know, I'm gonna take decisive action uh, because that's the direct affront to the incredible work that the men and women of the SJPD do every single day. Um, and so, you know, we're fortunate in San Jose. Uh, we have one of the best models of police oversight in the country. Um, I'm familiar with the office of the IPA, uh, and I know that they're critically important to the legitimacy and accountability of the department, uh, period. Um, I view my relationship, I, I will view my relationship and the department's work with the IPA uh, as absolutely essential uh, to our disciplinary, uh, disciplinary process. Um, you know, in terms of policy, uh, you know, most policies have duty to intercede, uh, and they also have, you know, uh, policies that govern um, when officers uh, have to report misconduct or use of force, uh, but policy alone is not enough. Um, you know, there's a saying uh, that culture eats policy for lunch, um, and that's certainly been my experience uh, as a chief. Um, so I know the character of the majority of the men, women and men of the SJPD, and I know what they stand for. Uh, they're professionals, uh, they're guardians who uh, hold each other accountable. Um, and coming back to the department, um, I'll be very interested in assessing the department's uh, early warning systems, uh, the data, how we're utilizing data uh, from the department's various use of force systems uh, and reporting practices, uh, training, uh, hiring, um, all of those things go into it uh, and what we've heard. Um, and so really it's about, you know, what, we're, what we profess as forming our culture, um, understanding those things so that I can encourage my officers to come forward um, with concerns not only by telling me, uh, not only by telling me, or me telling them, I'm sorry, uh, that I want them to do that and report things, but also by ensuring that our culture and our systems work to facilitate them being able to actually do it. Uh, that's the critical piece. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Chief Dahl, same question. Thanks, Gary. I uh, appreciate that. So, uh, as has been said, you know, obviously the chief serves a pivotal role um, in this process. You know, as a chief of police, I understand that everything that happens at the police department is ultimately my responsibility, and uh, in, in it, but it's also my responsibility to um, to set a, a culture of accountability uh, for everyone in the police department, and I think that's how uh, you ultimately get officers to be comfortable coming forward it, when they observe misconduct um, is you create that culture uh, where it's not just something that they're required to do by policy, but it's the expectation amongst their peers. Um, you, you know, a, a culture where if you know something happened and you don't come forward, then you're the one that's responsible for that uh, bad behavior. And so, you know, I, I just think that that's incumbent upon any chief to, to set that tone. You know, also the chief really is, and I know this from personal experience, the ultimate decision maker when it comes to cases of serious misconduct. Um, and that, uh, that everything that a command staff does when it comes to uh, handling, investigating, and ultimately meeting out discipline internally has to be reasonable, it has to be consistent, it has to be fair, 
uh, and non-emotion based, not based on personalities, but just based on the facts and circumstances with a, uh, a, the idea that, um, again, we, you have an organization made up of people. They're going to make mistakes from time to time. Mistakes are at the end of the world. Let's identify what happened, uh, how we can get past it, move on and grow both as individuals in the organization, um, but as, you know, as a department as a whole. And you know, we've had some significant misconduct issues in Anchorage. Um, we've had officers that ultimately uh, have been indicted and convicted of crimes just in the last couple of years. Um, but that's, you know, I think that really speaks well to the fact that um, our department really has that culture. We've been able to establish that because most of those cases were initially reported internally. And so I think that's something that, um, you know, really speaks well of our officers. Um, Everything I've seen is that San Diego has, or San uh, Jose has, excuse me. I've had San Diego on my mind because we have friends that live there and I just visited there recently. So I apologize for that. Um, in fact, Gary knew that I was probably gonna say that at some point <laughs> today. Uh, that, you know, San Jose has that same culture, uh, a strong culture of accountability. And I think that's great. Um, you know, something I've done as chief is really strive to, uh, to make immediate and timely notice to the public when we have a significant uh, misconduct case. You know, it's really important to, um, to let everyone know what's happening, let the police department know what we've done, um, how we've partnered with uh, the independent um, accountability entities that we work with to make sure that uh, prosecution occurs or an independent review occurs when appropriate. Um, all of those things are important. You know, I've also had experience as uh, chair of the Alaska Police Standards Council reviewing the significant discipline cases that uh, result in decertification. I think it's important for the public to see that that process exists. Um, but, um, you know, at the end of all of that, we're, we're holding our people accountable, we're creating that culture, uh, we're doing all those things. Um, we have everyone at the police department has to know that you know, you're going to have zero tolerance for misconduct, but at the same time, you're going to allow space for them to make mistakes, um, to acknowledge those mistakes and move on for them. And not every single mistake is a total catastrophe. So really the chief's role in all of that is balancing all of those things and making sure that at the same time that we're maintaining the public's trust, we're also maintaining that uh, sense of morale and integrity inside the police department. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, last step for this question is uh, Deputy Chief Mata. Thank you, Gary, and I'll make it fast since people want to go to lunch. <laughs> so um, as the chief, accountability starts with me, and the department is a reflection of my values and vision. Our community entrusts us with a tremendous power to keep our community safe, and with that power comes great responsibility. And we have to hold department members accountable to ensure that they are treating everyone with dignity, respect with, within our policy and the law. All discipline matters will be given immediate attention to ensure that these investigations are conducted in an, in an objective, professional, and ethical manner. The conduct and performance of the disciplinary process is a direct reflection of my leadership. As been said, I know that policies and procedures are not enough, so I will ensure that all department members receive proper training and supervision to ensure that the following policies and procedures and that their work is ethical and constitutional. Our workforce also needs to understand that policies and procedures are, are in place to protect them, the department, the city, and the community. That is something I, I did as the deputy chief of field operations for two, over two years. In June, 2020, I helped implement a department policy that requires officers to report excessive force by another officer and to intercede when present and observing such conduct. In addition, the department has policy that all department members will obey all department and city rules and regulations and all federal, state, and local laws. In order to ensure that all department members comply with these policies, I will create an environment and culture that fosters fairness, honesty, through progressive discipline that is fair, consistent, and transparent. And with the understanding that discipline is not always punitive, However, when the conduct is egregious, it will be punitive. All department members must also understand that discipline is used to set a standard for the organization and to change the behavior. Uh, there are current accountability measures already in place 
that allow for the release of police investigations and discipline related to deadly and serious use of force and proven sexual assault, dishonesty, and perjury crimes through Senate Bill 1421. In 2020, Measure G to say, uh, granted the city's independent police auditor with a greater expansion of the, her authority and allowed the review of certain investigations initiated by department members uh, in order to review un unredacted records of officer involved shootings and the use of force resulting in death uh, without a complaint. As a chief, I will work with the independent police officer's office to ensure that the department is transparent on these matters and that our disciplinary investigations are conducted with due process, are complete, fair, and thorough. Finally, I will work with the Police Officers Association to discuss disciplinary matters that need further discussion and also discuss with them any upcoming police disciplinary reforms that will affect the disciplinary process. Some of these items that have been discussed at the state level um, are the decertification of officers under specific conditions and the additional release of officer files expanding Senate Bill 1421. As a chief, it is important that our disciplinary process keeps pace with the current law and that our policies reflect that while we are ensuring that our officers are maintaining due process. Being transparent with our process will gain trust and legitimacy within the organization and with the community. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chief. Okay, the next question uh, relates to community interaction and outreach. And with this question, we're gonna start with Assistant Chief Scarato. Um, community trust and engagement is crucial to the success of the Chief of Police. Tell us about how you would engage different stakeholders in our community, specifically hard to reach communities, and how would you reconcile differences of opinion between the police and the community? Okay. I'd like to start by saying, I, I think back to, to Sir Robert Peel and his nine principles of policing and, and principle number seven speaks to the community or the police, the police or the community. And we fail to recognize that, that we are all, all an inclusive entity trying to live and keep our community safe. Uh, so you start with giving the community a voice giving the community a, a, a voice at the table when we're developing strategic initiatives, when we're developing, we're developing policy, when we're developing training and education, that they are a, a welcomed participant to everything that we do, that, that we remove all of the silos that law enforcement has existed in for decades to truly engage in community police partnerships. Uh, Pittsburgh, was one of six cities selected for the national initiative for building trust and justice. And, and so I, I think of the, the onset of, of that initiative and it's what is measured is evaluated. How do we know what our communities think of us if we don't ask? So the first thing we did to, to kick off that initiative was to do a community survey and, and, and ensure that we we're receiving feedbacks from our communities of color, our communities of color, our community, our underrepresented communities, our marginalized communities, as well as our business stakeholders and the communities that had influence, right? Because they matter as well. Uh, and, and then receiving that feedback loop on how to improve our services based on their recommendations. And, and more importantly, where were we deficient? And oftentimes we found that we were most efficient in areas we thought we were doing well at, and that was community outreach, that, that our officers weren't accessible, our officers weren't visible, that the communities felt detached and policed and told how and which way we would provide them services. So we engaged the community in a meaningful and impactful way that gave them a seat at the table. And as the chief, uh, San Jose has a chief's cabinet. My challenge for the chief's cabinet is if I have the opportunity to lead organizations that they have input, that it's not just, it's, it's not a, a, a cabinet of, of individuals that listen to what I choose to tell them, but that they make recommendations that influence how and which, how we train, how we develop policy. And, and that more important that they're an active participant 
in police services for the San Jose Police Department in the San Jose community. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize from chief to recruit that we are a service industry, that we exist to serve the community, and that we must set aside our own personal interests for the benefit and the greater good of those we profess to serve. And oftentimes I think that gets lost in law enforcement because we get concerned with priorities and data and we lose the human emotion and, and the connection that comes with creating relationships and partnerships and building trust. And, and I think when we set aside all of those, those, those data points and, and, and information points and we get down to the basic service industry that we will be a better more prepared, responsive organizations for the communities that we serve. Uh, how do we reconcile those differences? When there are, recognize we have shared goals for safety. And, and I'm a believer in the best idea wins, and it doesn't need to be mine. Uh, we are far more alike than we are different. We all want to live in a in, in community and work for a city that treats everyone, its officers and its citizens with dignity and respect. And I think if that is the foundation of why we exist, then, then we will be a much more representative police department for the communities we serve. Thank you. You need to unmute, Gary. Cap, thank you, Larry. Uh, Captain Toss, same question. All right, thank you, Gary. Um, I. I actually, uh, I, I think this question is phrased in a way where it, it, it's almost like a difficult question, but in, in fact, for me personally, this is probably the easiest part of my job. And so uh, with some of the harder to reach neighborhoods, the, the more needy neighborhoods, those are the neighborhoods that I find uh, for me personally are the most uh, kind of self-gratifying and, and rewarding to, to work with. And I'll tell you why, I think that when we come out to some of these neighborhoods and, and we really come out with a sincere uh, and genuine approach to connecting with neighbors, uh, to really getting to know who they are by name and really having that relationship. Uh, things start happening that, um, that are just, it just moves in the right direction. I think that some of the most needy neighborhoods uh, don't ask the most things from us. And when we have these relationships, uh, we start realizing that they're only asking for just basic human needs, you know, safety for themselves, safety for their children, uh, being treated respectfully as officers are walking through the area, uh, officers treating their children, you know, respectfully and, and being a role model for them. And so some of these things, I think, in, in these neighborhoods that are most inflicted by crime are the ones that, in my opinion, are the the best to work with because because these folks here are just so appreciative of any type of police services that we can provide for them. With regard to reconciling differences, I think again I'm going to theme back to the point where as chief, you know, I'm going to I'm going to do this by example, but but every level there underneath, you know, uh, sergeant, officer, lieutenant, captain, uh, we need to at every level uh, really put community. In, the, in, in our forefront of our um, strategy. And every level of officer really needs to have that mindset, that culture that they want to get to know their uh, either business owner, their community leader, some of the school leaders in their beat, in their district, and look for, again, look at those common, uh, those common themes that everybody is looking for. There's no secret recipe on trying to connect with uh, marginalized communities. You, you have to go out there. You have to talk with them. Sometimes those conversations are difficult, uh, but if you don't have these conversations, you don't have these connections, you will never improve some of the, uh, some of the problems that we see starting to erupt because of uh, ineffective communications. So I would just say that uh, just in closing that the community has a real big thirst for a better relationship with our police department. But our men and women of the San Jose Police Department do have that same thirst as well. So as chief, I intend to be committed to having these conversations, to building these bridges, 
and making that relationship stronger. Thank you. Thanks, Captain Toth. Appreciate it. Uh, Chief Tyndall, uh, tell us about how you engage different stakeholders in the community, specifically the hard to reach communities, and then how would you reconcile the differences of opinion between police and community? Well, I think there's uh, there's many things that make community interaction and outreach so important to us. And uh, community engagement can't be a project, is my first belief. It has to be part of our DNA, uh, both here at the police department and amongst all of our command staff. Um, with engagement and work, I mean, trust can certainly be earned, but without it, I will say that the relationships are lost. I will say that I'll never lose sight of that, that the police are, the, police are actually our community. Um, we have a lot of men and women, many who are residents of the city. Um, we do have an incredibly diverse police department and we have to put that to good use. Uh, I wanna make sure that we're focusing on building bridges and communities where language or religion or socioeconomic status may be a barrier to connecting with us or others in the city. Gary, your lights just went out. Um, there are over a hundred different languages spoken in San Jose and there will be no one person uh, that will be able to speak them all. Uh, a recent police academy of, of new officers spoke 10 different languages. But I will say this, if a Vietnamese speaking officer is not spending time with our Vietnamese community, then we're missing a very true and valid opportunity. If we're gonna make community engagement seriously and if we're gonna take it seriously, we have to provide officers with the time to participate in this work. We've initiated, we have initiated community policing officers. We did this quite a while ago, but we have to give priority to those officers who represent the demographic in that specific neighborhood. In a city of over 1 million people, we need all of our officers to commit to the effort and we have to provide them the resources to facilitate these interactions. Our department must show up and meet our community where they are and be able to speak in the languages that they speak I intend to use my vast amount of bilingual officers to accompany me as I go around every community that I've visited in the city. Engagement with our businesses, our residents, our faith-based organizations, our community groups, they have to be a priority and they have to be exemplified from the top. I've never been a stay behind my desk type of chief and I'm looking forward to get back into community engagement that is outside of this virtual world that we're doing right now or done at a distance. Um, and this can be done in a number of different ways. I know as the, uh, as the chief's office, we have a community advisory board, but I think we also need to create a similar advisory board for each of our division captains. Uh, we're a centralized police department, but we need to decentralize <coughs> some of our command level engagement so it can scale and include more people. We need to basically see the communities of color, which are very complex and different in every aspect, meet the men and women, and also the command structure of this police department. I think we also need to engage all of our stakeholders who may not have positive experiences with the police. I understand, and especially of, as of late, that experiences with the police, that trust may, have broke, may be broken. And I think the first step is to listen, and to listen, and we need to listen some more. I also wanna create a space where they can feel free of, of criticism of our department without fear of jeopardizing our relationship. We should all be able to sit behind a table and have a true and honest conversation. We will not agree and we will probably not agree on many aspects, but every instance of conflict creates an opportunity to improve our operations and improve our perspective of those that we're working in partnership with. As we look at redistricting and how we deploy our officers in the future, we need to build time for community engagement. This means investing in resources and the effort because we believe we will not get a return on our investment unless we do this. I also know that people communicate in different ways and we have to listen in those ways as best we can. I certainly know in going out at rocket ship school before that we use technology in that space and it worked very effectively. We need multiple ways for the community to provide us feedback and the languages that they are comfortable with. I will say this, community engagement is one of the areas we have the greatest opportunity to improve and evolve. And I think, and I will make it central to everything that we do at this police department. Thank you. Thanks Chief, appreciate it. Chief Bowers, same question. So, um, 
Let me just say, uh, first and foremost, that uh, there is nothing uh, more important in policing than building and maintaining trust with the community. Um, and uh, that is, that's about relationships. It's about relationships and transparency, period. Um, I have a track record of doing that in San Jose um, in my current role uh, as the chief in Piedmont um, and will continue to do so. Uh, so when we think about transparency um, and relationships, uh, those two things uh, that are so critical, um, you know, so what does that mean? Uh, as the chief in Piedmont, uh, I brought the community into our strategic planning process. Uh, we held focus groups. Uh, we invited community leaders and members um, from the public to take part in our forming of our strategic plan uh, to let us know how we were doing, where we needed to improve, and what they needed to see and hear from us. Uh, we committed to making our, um, our plan available uh, to the public uh, online, uh, including the feedback and the sentiment from those focus groups and from those members of our community um, so, that, so that we're not gonna be interpreting what they're saying, but we're gonna be giving them the voice uh, so we can all hear what, what the perspective of our community is. Uh, I would look for those similar inclusive and transparency um, opportunities in San Jose. Um, and again, that's been my track record. Uh, although I've been away uh, for a few years, um, the relationships I've built and the familiarity I have uh, with the various community-based organizations um, uh, in the community leaders uh, will allow me to, to re-engage and engage with them. Uh, with regard to some of the hard to reach communities, um, it takes work, plain and simple. You gotta get out there and work. And obviously it's challenged right now because of COVID and we need to be inventive with that. Um, but the bottom line, you know, reaching out to communities that are, that are hard to reach such as the unhoused, um, those who historically have had challenging relationships uh, with the police or because of other barriers that may exist um, we need to do everything. I, I will do everything I can to reach out to them, you know, including, you know, ensuring that that's why you have partners, community partners and allies uh, to access those folks in those hard to reach areas. Um, and so, you know, it's going to take often at times meeting them where they are at, literally and figuratively. Um, and so the critical aspect about relationships that we build and maintain um, is, again, that's got to be genuine. And it's got to be not during a crisis. And it's not going to be because it's strategic or uh, for a utilitarian purpose, but it's about developing those relationships and, familiar, and familiar, familiarity, excuse me, uh, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, so we understand uh, how all of our communities want to be served. Um, I also believe that the men and women of this department believe in this, uh, in the San Jose Police Department, that they have strong ties to the community already, and I would absolutely look to leverage and add to that. Um, as a new chief, outreach and connection uh, with the community uh, is important and it's important internally as well with the rank and file um, and that will absolutely be a priority for me. Uh, some things uh, have changed with the city and the department since I've left while other aspects of it uh, have remained. Uh, the unique and beneficial aspect uh, of my return as the chief is my familiarity of those things that have remained and my fresh perspective uh, that I bring for the things that have changed. Um, there's going to be differences of opinion and uncomfortable conversations. Um, and so to reconcile those differences of opinion, uh, you know, we need to be resilient and we need to be, again, comfortable being uncomfortable in those conversations. Uh, and I believe that the bottom line is, you know, again, it, it was mentioned before, but we have to, we have to in order to reconcile our, our differences, acknowledge that we have commonalities. We all want safe communities free of trauma from all sources from which they may come. And we all wanna be treated with dignity and respect. And when we hone in on those fundamental things that are so precious to all of us, um, that's when we're gonna be able to reconcile um, and, and again, be able to engage in tough conversations. So thank you. Thanks Chief, appreciate it. Um, Chief Dahl, same question, you're up. Thanks Gary. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, the beginning of the question is community trust and engagement is crucial to the success of the police chief. I actually think community trust is critical to the entire police department. Um, I, I think a police department literally cannot function if you do not have the community's trust and faith in what you're doing. And I, and I think we've all seen examples of that in different parts of the country, and, uh, and none of us want to have that. Um, it, you know, as other speakers have mentioned, relationship building is the key. Um, it's the key for the chief. Um, but it's it's actually key to every single member of the department. I think that um, my vision here in Anchorage uh, and the vision I would bring to San Jose is that every single time 
any member of the police department, whether it's um, a brand new patrol officer and she's working mid shift or it's uh, a guy who's in the call center, every single person, every time you have a contact with a member of the community, that is an engagement and relationship building opportunity. And it's really incumbent upon the chief to set that tone for uh, him or herself, but also all the way down through the entire organization. That's the focus of everything we do is every single one of those uh, meeting points is a relationship building opportunity. Um, for a chief, especially uh, someone like myself, a new chief coming in uh, as a new member of the community, um, you have to get out and do it personally, in person. Uh, it's a challenge during COVID. I think that's actually one of the most fun things about being a chief of police. There are many things that are not so fun, um, but it's the, uh, the opportunity to get out and talk to people face to face. Um, I'm really looking forward to having an opportunity to do that in San Jose. Um, I think as a new community member, a new member of the department and a new chief, um, that's going to be critical, but also very exciting to get to learn all of the various viewpoints uh, that make up the community of San Jose. Um, you know, community engagement um, is really can be difficult for a police department sometimes, especially a department that is uh, feels staffing pressure on a daily basis. You know, that kind of pressure creates um, a sense for officers and other staff that you have to kind of rush from task to task and not slow down and take time to listen and to talk to people. Um, we experienced that uh, here uh, as we were rebuilding and we really pushed hard on the idea that you need to slow down. You need to listen to what people are telling, telling you when you're on a call for service. You need to engage with them. Um, and then you need to uh, spend a little time uh, telling them about what you did. Um, we, we have amazing officers here in Anchorage. Uh, everything that I've seen is that you have amazing officers in San Jose. Um, and, but I think that we, we miss out on that. And part of that is just uh, law enforcement officers in general don't tend to want to slow down or to take the time to sort of talk about the things that they did. Um, we felt uh, there's a general feeling in the community here that uh, they would reach out to the police department for help and nothing would happen. And what we found almost every single time we heard one of those concerns was that we had spent a lot of time and effort trying to address whatever the problem was that the community had reached out to us for, but then we never told them what we did. And so we really emphasize closing the loop, having officers, even if it's the middle of the night um, and you're responding to a prowler in the neighborhood, um, you know, uh, leave a text message or a voicemail or, uh, you know, do some kind of, you know, we created a door hanger so you could leave a little note on someone's door. Hey, I was here. I heard about your problem. This is what we did. We resolved it or we didn't observe it, but please reach back out to us if we can help you. That was um, very successful here. Um, we use technology to do that. You know, we rolled out smartphones to everybody in the department, but, um, you know, I just really feel like uh, it requires that level of personal engagement by the chief uh, all the time inside and outside the department. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Deputy Chief Mata, uh, same question, community trust and engagement. Um, how would you engage the different stakeholders in the community, specifically the hard to reach communities? And then how would you reconcile the differences of opinion? Thank you, Gary. And uh, I agree with uh, Chief Dahl that uh, our trust in the community and engagement is not only crucial for the success of the police chief, but it's very crucial for the success of the department. Without the community's trust and confidence, we will be ineffective as an organization. This is why my vision for the department is that all residents and visitors of this city have the highest trust and confidence in this department through excellent service at all levels and by building relationships with all of our stakeholders. Currently, our profession has failed and lost the community's trust through the actions of officers nationwide. Officers are giving tremendous power and authority to keep our community safe and protect lives. And because of that, officers face a high level of scrutiny <clears throat> than ever before. Uh, however, as a profession um, and a professional organization, we cannot be fearful of that scrutiny. We have to be transparent and demonstrate to our community that we are professional and ethical. Through transparency and accountability, we can highlight the great work that our officers do every day. And when we come up short, we will address it and correct it. When our communities trust us and have confidence in us, they will assist us in keeping our community safe. As the chief 
during these difficult times, I have to remind our officers to recall the question of why they became an officer. And the answer is gonna to be to help people and make a difference. So to help officers remember their why, we have to intentionally engage officers in the community. Officers who are highly engaged in the community practice their why and are highly productive while also building trust in our communities. One of the tenets of my vision for developing trust and confidence is building relationships with those stakeholders. Let's face it, we are in the people business and that means building relationships and connecting and engaging with the community. The success of any relationship is trust and to build trust, one has to be genuine, honest, compassionate and collaborative. These are my values. As a chief, one of my goals is to align the organization with these same values so that we can build trust in our community. During my 30 year career, I have met numerous business owners, community members, faith leaders, special interest groups, and others to develop strong relationships. I have also collaborated generally and effectively with members of our diverse and most vulnerable communities. Because of these relationships, I have sought to ensure that our community policing and crime reduction strategies are deployed in a fair and just manner. And in doing so, I have been able to build trust and make a difference in our community. As chief, I intend to further engage the community to build stronger relationships and partnerships and earn that community trust. I will legitimize our services through accountability and transparency. I will continue to engage our entire community by listening and having those difficult conversations and will be available and present in my, in my community as I've always been. My collaboration will make our community safer because we know that together we can make a difference. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, uh, Chief Mata. Uh, and the last uh, candidate on this question is Deputy Chief Randall. Do you need the question? Thank you, Gary. I don't need the question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Chief. Um, Community trust and engagement is, is crucial and we need to engage our community more widely and more deeply. Um, we haven't always done a good job at this, especially with our hard to reach communities. So this means we need to go to where they are, to churches, to schools, go to their neighborhoods and really understand the challenges that each community faces um, in the languages that they speak so that everyone can be heard. We need to expand our outreach um, in more languages, in written materials and translation services when available and needed so that everybody can be heard. And it's so, so uh, and needed right now. As a chief, I wanna look to expand my outreach to more people and be thoughtful and ensure that I'm truly listening to the community and to what they're saying. We, in our organization, we need to empower our command staff to engage more thoughtfully um, with more of our community and we need everyone to be a part of this as a force multiplier. We need to empower everyone in the organization to continuously engage and build relationships. And we should expect this to happen. Um, our rank and file should feel like they can engage our community through a variety of ways um, and not have to wait for approval. Community engagement should be expected just like responding to a call for service. Everyone in the organization needs to be able to make decisions um, in support of our vision. And we can't have a department that only engages through the chief or at specific events like um, a divisional meeting or coffee with a cop. Um, it needs to be woven into the fabric of what we do every single day and all of our interactions. Um, we don't need two separate avenues. It's not policing and then community policing. They should be one and the same. Officers should be engaging the community daily. And I think Acting Chief Tyndall mentioned how many calls for service we have a year. That's anywhere between 350 and 400,000 chances to engage the community every single day. I want our values to be so ingrained throughout the department that everybody has solutions. They can make decisions without waiting for approval. And we can do this when we have clear and guiding goals. So how do we reconcile the differences between the community and police? We know that there's always gonna be a time when we're not in complete agreement. We know this. And we, the police, we don't always have to be right, but we have to be more care, uh, more comfortable when uh, we are wrong. And then in those cases, we have to take action to right those wrongs. 
the chief and everyone in the organization needs to listen and understand our community. This is what our community wants. Someone who will listen and make an earnest effort to affect that needed change. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Randall. Okay, so our last question uh, relates to recruitment and retention and Captain Ta will go first. Uh, the city of San Jose is a community with a broad range of diversity, including race, gender, language, life experience, and cultural background. As a new chief of police, what would be your plan to recruit and promote staff to ensure the overall police department, including the command staff, reflect our diverse community? Thank you, Gary. So we do a good job uh, right now with uh, recruiting, uh, with uh, using a marketing firm. We, we also have uh, literature that has a wide variety of languages and imagery that really show that level of diversity that you had just referenced. Um, as a recruiter myself, I was uh, recruited for most of my career and I worked actually a lot in the Vietnamese community, obviously, because I understand the, the culture and I speak the language uh, it was kind of a, a good fit for me, but I also went out to recruiting uh, seminars and, and booths all up and down uh, with different colleges and recruiting other ethnicities, not just uh, the Asian community. So in my opinion, uh, the recruiting is, is very good in terms of diversity. I would like to see as chief uh, how we could incentivize recruiting more locally within our, our city. Uh, as a young man growing up in San Jose, all my friends uh, growing up in San Jose in the, the 80s, everybody wanted to be a, a police officer or a firefighter. And I think that uh, my vision would be at some point, let's get us back there uh, to, you know, at some point, not today, but maybe tomorrow and maybe next year. But uh, that, that's where that community uh, connection has to be kind of solidified a little bit more. And so... Uh, the best recruiting mechanism that I see is the highest ranking person uh, in that in that ethnicity being uh, the, the best recruiting tool, whether that's chief or a sergeant. I mean, young people of color, they look to uh, people of authority and they just kind of picture themselves, you know, in that in that role. And and so to the extent possible, uh, as we hire diverse officers, uh, we need to really look inwardly to see how we develop that diversity. So at every level of our organization, as they rise through the ranks to sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and so on, we have an equal and equitable way of really selecting who we uh, give opportunities to, who we provide professional development to, and ultimately who we promote, because that is all relevant on how that is going to have some and unintended outcomes with recruiting. Uh, obviously, if the, the, the chief of police is an African-American, uh, you know, a, a younger African-American uh, kids in the community are really gonna aspire to try to reach his level. And so um, in summary, uh, we, we do a great job. I believe that somewhere along the lines in the middle, um, in the middle kind of ranks, we could probably do a little bit better and uh, however that, that happens as we look inwardly and we, we look towards pro-social programs that really connect kids with cops like the PAL program, uh, open gym program, the vote volunteer program and internship programs, we could start getting a pipeline for those internal candidates that have lived here, that have family here, that have skin in the game. And that would be a very good addition to the San Jose PD family. Thank you, Thank Captain you. Todd. Appreciate it. Um, chief Tyndall, um, as a new chief, what would be your plan to recruit and promote staff to ensure the overall police department, including the command staff, staff reflects the diversity of the community? Thanks, Gary. Um, first, I think that uh, I believe the department's strengths it really just it lies and in, in starts with their diversity. Uh, we are a city of over 1 million people. And in that 1 million people uh, in San Jose, they speak over 100 different languages. And we also have to look at the fact that our population is over 70% of color. 
So when you look at that, I think that's a starting point to know what, you know, you have to know what your community looks like. We're also a department who is itself roughly 50% of color uh, with 12% of those being female. Um, we are experienced and I'm happy to take part in some of the most diverse recruitment and academies we've ever seen. I just graduated one of the most diverse academies to date last week whose graduates spoke 10 different languages. So I would say we are in fact creating a department that reflects, connects and identifies with those that we serve. But we do have to remind ourselves that also diversity of thought, experience, knowledge, backgrounds, demographics, previous professions, religions, sexual orientations and languages, those are really what makes San Jose PD what it is. This will and cannot stop. One of my main missions as it relates to recruitment is, the, is to promote policing as a career path to serving and improving our community. We need to reconnect with youth and young adults to not only inspire them to serve, but also educate them on what police work really is. And it's not what they see on TV or sometimes how it's portrayed in social media. It's about problem solving and connecting with our residents in a meaningful way that creates a safe community. You know, last week we facilitated a meeting between one of our officers who grew up in foster care and another from an inner city that was not San Jose uh, with foster youth here in San Jose. And I gotta say, just when I talk, about it. I mean, this type of open dialogue is not only immeasurable, it opens doors and paves the way for, for ways and things that we just don't do enough of, and we really just can't stop doing it. While we must continue to hire diverse candidates, we must ensure that our efforts also reflect our community, and it does not stop after initial hire. In all of my leadership roles here at San Jose PD, I've always been a big proponent of access to training and succession planning in the groups that I, you know, whether it be uh, promotional groups that I ran, but this is an area that we have to do more. I remember a time this department when many of our employees left for other police agencies, each had their own reasons, but I chose to stay seeing our sworn ranks depleted to about 800 officers. It was truly here that I learned the value of our officers who did so much at that time with so little. While, we're, while we are growing and hopefully not going back, I will never lose sight of not only hiring diverse personnel, but keeping and retaining all of our personnel here. Employees that are valued will stay. I would expand our mentoring programs and ensure that those that feel comfort and wanting to promote and have that opportunity regardless of path taken. I would institute a system that tracks those we are providing opportunities to in the form of specialty training and other forms of experience. I would ensure employees' needs are being met, not only in the work sense, but physically, mentally, and emotionally through wellness. And our officers are the most important, valuable asset, and this is something that we can never forget. Great. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Chief. Chief Bowers, same question. Well, thank you, Gary. Um, you know, clearly uh, diversity is critical. It's absolutely critical. It's critical that you know we have a department uh, that reflects the incredible diversity uh, of the city uh, of San Jose that we're serving. Um, but one of the key things that I always think about with diversity is is inclusion, um, because that has to be the other part of the equation. Uh, so first and foremost, you know, uh, San Jose. Uh, I've seen a couple of the most uh, most uh, recent academy graduations, and uh, they have done a fantastic job at recruiting a diverse uh, department. Um, and, and I think they, I think the department should be applauded for that and the efforts of uh, the work of the women and men who've been a part of that should be applauded for that. Um, and, and, and again, I do think we need to think about uh, not just uh, diverse backgrounds, but diversity of thought as well, ensuring that the people we're bringing on um, are critical thinkers, um, are people with emotional intelligence. Um, all that is, is critically important. Um, and, and you have to be very intentional uh, with recruiting. So I would, coming in as the new chief, would absolutely look at what systems have been in place and, and what we've been doing and, and what opportunities exist to, you know, uh, to move it to the next level. Absolutely, I think we're always gonna be seeking uh, to improve. Um, but we have to ask ourselves how we're developing our diverse workforce. That's part of the equation. That's the other piece of the equation. And, and are we being inclusive? Uh, to answer that question, um, I would convene an internal equity work group. Uh, when I come on uh, as the next chief, uh, made up of a cross section of sworn and professional staff uh, from throughout the organization. Um, and I would like to explore partnering uh, 
with the partnering the internal equity work group uh, with the city's uh, relatively newly formed Office of Racial Equity. And I would like to look at what we're doing from top to bottom, uh, looking at our testing processes, looking at promotional reading lists, looking at assignment practices, uh, leadership and management development, um, and looking at, just looking at the whole gamut of things that we're doing internally uh, to provide recommendations and, and identify barriers uh, to not only diversity, uh, but also inclusion. Um, I would also look uh, to our community um, and to our work on racial equity uh, and reimagining public safety uh, to inform our efforts of recruitment, uh, inclusion, and retention uh, of a diverse uh, workforce. Uh, but again, uh, my efforts uh, in building and maintaining a diverse workforce uh, will, also, will always um, you know, necessarily include inclusion. Um, that because that is the other half of the equation uh, right. that we have to be intentional about. Great. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Okay, Chief Dahl, same question. Hey, thanks, Gary. Uh, first, I just want to apologize. I realize the sun's coming up behind me and washing me out a little bit, but I'm reluctant to shut it out. We're finally getting a little daylight and sunshine here in Anchorage, so it does feel good, but apologies for that. Um, you know, I, uh, it, it sounds like San Jose really is doing a good job of, uh, of having some diversity in their recruiting. Um, I think that's great. I know that's something we've really worked on here in Anchorage. Um, we have a very diverse community, but, you know, we've been looking at the police department over the last few years, and it, and it really didn't reflect the, uh, the community the way we wanted it to. So we put a lot of effort into trying to figure out why that was happening, um, what we could do better. And, uh, and we just uh, seated one of our most diverse academy classes ever. And, and really, um, uh, the, our, our captain of administration who's in charge of uh, backgrounds and recruiting came up with an idea that was very simple, um, but very uh, impactful. And it was just reaching out to uh, our, uh, our BIPOC recruits in a way that was, um, frankly, just more frequent and in a much more personalized way. And it really made a difference. Um, they felt connected uh, right from the very beginning of the background and hiring process. And that was, that was great for us. It's really worked out well. Um, you know, as has been said time and again, you know, diversity, uh, having the department uh, reflect uh, the community inclusion, um, all those things are critical for departmental success. It really helps you with all of the engagement opportunities that you have with your city. Um, but recruiting is also, uh, you know, all the other topics we've talked about today are linked into recruiting. If you have elements of your community that don't feel comfortable with the police department, they don't feel appropriately served by the police department, they're not going to step forward and volunteer for careers in law enforcement. And right now, uh, you know, a career in law enforcement is maybe not as exciting as it has been in the past. We know that the profession as a whole is facing lots of challenges. And so we really have to weave that recruiting effort into all of the engagement that we're also working on just to be an effective law enforcement uh, organization. And so it has to be something that we're really doing every day. And then uh, that has to carry through uh, to your internal selection processes, whether there are selections for uh, assignments or promotion. Um, you really have to be doing that same sort of recruiting uh, and diversity and inclusion thought process as part of that I know as a chief, I don't want to be surrounded by people on my command staff that all look and think exactly like me. Um, we don't problem solve well that way, right? We know that good problem solving comes from uh, diversity of thought, um, having people with lots of different uh, lived experiences and backgrounds um, being part of that process. So that's always been very important to me um, to make sure that we have space for that. You know, I, I really want to be, uh, I want to be challenged from time to time in my thinking um, by the people uh, that are part of my leadership team. And, uh, and so I think it's really important as a chief to be focused on that internally as well as externally. So, um, you know, I, I really think that's, uh, that's something that I would continue to do if I had an opportunity to come down and be part of the leadership team in San Jose. I think that'd be great. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in Anchorage really reaching out to uh, members of the BIPOC community, um, sitting down with them, doing those engagement opportunities, um, but also um, recognizing that those are recruiting opportunities as well and really emphasizing the fact that um, even though they have concerns about the police department, um, they can be part of the process of change um, by stepping forward and taking on that public service role that um, all police officers engage in. So um, 
anyway, I just, I think all of these things tie together and in some ways they culminate in, in recruiting and the way you structure your organization. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Deputy Chief Mata, same question. Thank you, Gary. Our profession is noble and honorable. And now more than ever, we, we recognize, or I recognize, the need to continue recruiting and promoting the next generation of officers who are diverse, representative of our communities, have a spirit of service, and have emotional intelligence. We must review how we currently select officers and find ways to identify issues of bias early on so that we hire, assign, and promote the right people for critical positions. Having the right people in the right positions allows the organization to be highly effective. As a Latino, I, re I represent that those, that those that are not provided those same opportunities. I will ensure that our department is welcoming to both our community and all department members. This will be done by being equitable, inclusive, and providing the same opportunities to all department mem members of all genders, races, and backgrounds. I will not tolerate discrimination, harassment, or the existence of an insider network. Our current police reform principles emphasize the importance of recruiting, assigning, and promoting qualified and competent individuals to serve our diverse communities. I have listened and know that our communities want an officer that speaks their language, understands their experiences, and is emotionally intelligent. As an organization, when we provide that level of service, we will be highly engaged and effective while also building our trust in the community. As a chief, I will create a department that is welcoming so that we can better serve our community. I will develop a workforce that understands what cultural competency means through training and community engagement. I will create a highly engaged and connected organization where the community is treated well so that our residents have high trust and confidence in this department and an organization that individuals want to be a part of. I understand that there is a gap in our workforce diversity. We do a great job of recruiting and hiring diversity, but still have a gap assigning and promoting diversity at all ranks. I will ensure that our organization is intentional, not just talk, it's intentional in mentoring, training, developing, and providing opportunities to all department members of all genders and races and backgrounds. I know this can be done because I have done it. I have mentored, trained, developed, and provided opportunities to members of our diverse workforce at every rank for over 20 years with the understanding that those that I help have to help others so that we, we become a competent and diverse workforce. For over 20 years, I continue to mentor, tutor, and provide department tours to youth in our most vulnerable communities through various school programs such as the Role Model Program and LASE at Evergreen Valley College, the City Peace Project on the East Side. My purpose is to help others and give back. As the chief, I will continue to ensure that I represent, advocate, and remove barriers and limitations for those that are marginalized in our community and our organization so that everyone of all genders and races are represented. As a resident of San Jose for nearly 25 years, I'm invested in this city. My wife works at a local community college in San Jose. My children attend school here in San Jose. We attend church in East San Jose. San Jose is very diverse and our organization needs to be representative of our community. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, Deputy Chief Randall, you're next up on this question. Do you, do you need it? You got it. No, I'm, I'm good. good. Thank you, Gary. Okay. We want to have a department that represents our community as closely as possible. This is what our community demands. And I'm going to start first by what I have done. I led a team of highly motivated officers and civilian staff to restructure our recruiting and background unit at a time when our department was at an all-time low. This included recruiting outreach with a focus on diversity, looking for that applicant pool that brought in a diverse group of people, but whose goals and visions aligned with our department. And we not only began reaching our goal of academies filled to capacity, but we had the most diverse academies ever in the history of our department, including 
an academy with the most women in the history of our San Jose Police Department. We had academies where there were over a dozen languages spoken. And this is something I am very passionate about and I'm very proud of the work that we did. We competed. We competed with every other agency around us. And not only did we get the best and the brightest, but we got the most diverse to come to San Jose. And more recently, we're continuing to work on this, on our recruiting and backgrounding. And we've added questions to our background process that were specifically designed to understand an applicant's belief system and to root out people with racist beliefs or ideals. Because we know once an officer is hired, it's very hard to get rid of them. I also took charge of mentoring women who graduate the academy. I put together mentoring groups for them, offering them help and support as they develop in their career. And I've also ensured that officers here, especially the ones in my chain of command and throughout the department, have a chance to attend training, do temporary assignments, so that they can gain experience and confidence and develop in their careers so they can better serve our community. Here's where we need to bolster our efforts. Oftentimes, opportunity and mentoring is done in an ad hoc way. And this can lead to people being left out um, or feeling like they're not supported. So we need to ensure that we put effort and resources into mentorships that allow for opportunities for officers, officers, sergeants, and lieutenants, so they can gain experience, exposure, and prepare themselves for those promotional opportunities. Um, we must demand that our current leadership consider a person's competency and aptitude, but also what they can bring to the table in terms of different perspectives, diversity in race, gender, education, diversity in thought. This is where the chief sets the tone and builds a command staff that can do this. It takes constant effort and intentionality and being engaged with the workforce, really seeing who's coming into the department and connecting with them. Um, we can't wait, and I, I've always said this and I keep repeating it, but we need to start as soon as officers graduate the academy so that we can build diversity up through the ranks. Right now, I have captains who seek out individuals who represent a diverse community and they put them on committees, they place them in community policing positions, and this works both to provide opportunities for our officers, um, but also develop them as future leaders. And that's what we want here. We want future leaders that represent a diverse group all the way through the ranks. So um, our investment in our officers starts with hiring, but it should not end there. And it needs to continue throughout their career. Thank you. Thanks, Chief Randall. Appreciate it. Okay, last up on this question is Chief Scarato. Uh, you'll have the last word on recruitment and retention. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd start by saying that recruitment and retention are mutually exclusive. Uh, when I came on to the police department, uh, started considering Pittsburgh, I looked up the chain of command and looked to the top to see if there were any people that looked like me, that sounded like me. And, and I think when I saw that, I, I knew that Pittsburgh was the place for me. It was representative of me. Uh, recruiting and retention have to be intentional uh, and inclusive and accountable and supportive. And, and what do I mean by all of that? Uh, intentional. I, when I had the responsibility of recruiting and hiring with Pittsburgh for four years from 14 to 18 when I left, we increased minority employment to 36% ethnic and gender minorities with ethnic minorities making up 22%. The next year, 2019 to 2020, the number of ethnic minorities decreased to 12 in, in a matter of two years uh, when it is not an intentional focus of the organization. Uh, when I looked up the chain, I, I was responsible for building a command staff, an executive leadership team that was as diverse as I would contend any for our size. Uh, we had 17 executive leaders in the command team and of that 64% of the command team were minorities, either ethnic, gender or sexual orientation. Uh, we had seven women, we had four LGBTQ members, we had four ethnic minorities and that provides us with a, an opportunity to champion organizational diversity for those that would be seeking to come upon our ranks. And more importantly, 
for those that are working within our ranks, that they know that they look up to the top of the chain of command, they look up to the leadership team, and they can achieve that level of success as well. Uh, building a diversity organization isn't easy. I mean, it comes with a lot of hard work and, and it must be an accountability level on the executive leadership team to maintain that. Uh, the mayor's office and the city managers should have set benchmarks for hiring to include ethnic, cultural, sexual, and gender minorities. And, and oftentimes we don't, we say we do it and, and we can promote and discuss some type of numbers, but the reality is we're never held to any type of account to what that number should look like to ensure that that we are building an inclusive organization. Uh, whenever we talk about supportive environments, I, I like to talk about the things that I've done. And, and I'm proud of the fact that we hired, three years ago, we hired the first two transgender officers into our organization. And I authored the gender nonconforming policy with cooperation and, and participation from our LGBTQ community to develop training and education, not only so that the two officers would feel supported within our organization, but the officers that exist within our organization would be able to develop a level of understanding and, and a, a level of, of ease with something that is different to them, that we have a responsibility, not to just those that are in the minority class, but we have a responsibility to those that are the majority as well, to create a welcoming a, a environment that all of our officers thrive in. So I think it's important that we focus on continuing to build a diverse organization. It promotes divergent thinking, creative problem solving. When we tap into the, the life experiences and the uniqueness of all of our individuals, we create a better product. And I think that is my commitment to San Jose if given the opportunity to be the chief. Thanks, Chief Scarato. Uh, appreciate it. Okay, um, so at this point, um, I wanna thank all the candidates for their thoughtful responses. And we are way over on time. So I'm gonna ask uh, each of you to provide a very short closing, like one minute. Um, and we'll start with Chief Tyndall. Thank you, Gary. I just want to thank the city and this community for the opportunity to serve and present some of my ideas that I will bring forward as your new chief of police. Um, my experience in every corner of the city and in every bureau of this department is not only invaluable, it allows me to focus on where we are here and where we are now. I will say that I'm fully committed to working with our community to re-examine how and why we do things. And I'm not gonna let the hard work or questions of process deter us from forging forward in our reimagining process. We need to work with urgency to meet this moment and we have demonstrated our commitment to doing so. And the one thing I won't do is lose sight of respons our responsibility to ensure that there's a police officer if you are residents call. This department has proven that it can do more with less with safe face setbacks unlike any um, and San Jose has always led the way in aggressive policing when it comes to progressiveness. I am fully committed and stand ready to continue our relationships with all to include our immigrant community, our faith-based organizations, our businesses, and all of our residents in this great city. I and our department will not let you down, and it would be my humble honor to lead this police department in our next chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Uh, Chief Bowers, uh, a, a short closing, please. Thank you. Got it, Gary. Appreciate it. Thank no you. Problem. And I want to thank the city of San Jose uh, for providing this opportunity today. And I want to thank the other candidates uh, for their participation, their contributions to our profession. Um, and, and first and foremost, I want to thank all those who tuned in today uh, uh, because this is so important. We are, listen, we're embarking uh, on an evolution of policing here in San Jose. Uh, with all that lies ahead, uh, the time, uh, quite frankly, is right for me to return as the chief of police uh, to join in this critically important work uh, because of my track record uh, with San Jose and, uh, and also because I have a differentiated perspective uh, as the chief of police for the last four years in the Bay Area. Uh, this is personal for me. Um, I'm the right person with the unique perspective 
and I'm uniquely positioned uh, to be San Jose's next chief of police. Um, I'm honored uh, to have had this opportunity. And I appreciate the time we've had today to talk together. Um, so I appreciate it uh, and I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Chief Dahl. Thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, I just wanna echo the other panelists. Uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be part of this process. Um, I'm honored to be included. It's clear to me that uh, San Jose is a great city. It's very welcoming um, and uh, very uh, inclusive of people with outside perspectives. Um, it's also very apparent to me after uh, hearing from the other panelists today that there is a lot of talent at the San Jose Police Department. It looks like you have a lot of amazing people in key leadership positions. And you know, I, I really would like to be a, a part of that leadership team. Um, I've been very excited uh, over the last week or two as I've been considering um, the opportunity to become a member of the San Jose community. But honestly, after today, I'm even more excited about it. Um, I would love to bring my perspective to uh, San Jose Police Department and be a member of that senior leadership team that takes uh, San Jose PD to the next level. So thanks again, uh, really looking forward to uh, the rest of the process and getting to meet more people. Thanks, Chief. Deputy Chief Mata, you're closing. Thanks, Gary. This country and this city uh, has been through a lot, pandemic, economic crisis, and, and the social justice movement. Our city needs hope, optimism, and change, and I'm ready for that challenge. I'm ready to make positive changes for the betterment of the organization and the community. I have a great passion uh, for this department and for this profession. I have tremendous compassion for the community and all the department members here at this department. I'm ready to improve our police service and to improve morale so that our staff find satisfaction in their work because we know, or I know, that our workforce is very important to us in, in this uh, type of work. Thank you for everyone for attending and good luck to all the candidates. Thank you, Chief Mata. Uh, Deputy Chief Randall. Thank you, Gary. I wanna thank you for this opportunity. I am truly humbled to be a part of this process. I'm fiercely committed uh, to this department and to this community and in whatever capacity I end up serving in this department. I'm dedicated to the success of the reimagining process, including the difficult culture shifts needed to accomplish this goal. I will never lose sight of keeping crime and response times low. When you're looking for a leader, you're looking for someone who will rise to the occasion and I've done that my entire career. You need somebody with a deep understanding of our community we serve and the unique circumstances of this department that I and I proudly represent a perspective that no chief has had in the history of our department. Again, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Chief Scarato. Thanks, Gary. Hey, I want to thank everybody that participated in this from the community to the, the candidates to, to city management and leadership. This is a defining moment in policing, a movement that will impact the profession for decades to come. And I want to be the leader that meets that challenge for the San Jose Police Department. Uh, I have proven to advance innovative policing strategies uh, it, throughout my career, and I am continuing to dedicate myself to improving our profession, improving San Jose as an organization and the communities in which we serve. Uh, while not from San Jose, I, I get that to be a challenge. What I know is transferable, no matter where you come from, is respect, integrity, and commitment to service. And I pledge that to the San Jose Police Department if given the opportunity to lead. Thank you, Chief. Captain Ta, uh, you will get the last word uh, this morning. Um, so uh, one minute closing, please. Thank you, Gary. I'll just cut to the chase. I feel that in my 25 years here in San Jose, living here and working here, uh, this is the time where San Jose PD really needs a transformational leader, a change, somebody that can bring in uh, some of these relationships that obviously are, are somewhat a little bit frayed. What I bring to the table is something unique. I'm, I'm an insider, but I'm not part of the conventional way of thinking. Uh, I'm gonna bring in a level of objectivity and experience, knowledge, education uh, that will bring me credibility within the rank and file of our department as well. So I just want to thank all of you guys for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. And I want to just leave with one parting thought that uh, I really want this job. 
So thank you very much for your consideration. Thanks, Captain Ta. That was thank good. Um, well, and I want to and I want to thank everyone uh, for tuning in. And I want to turn it over to the city manager for some parting words. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Um, I want to thank you for facilitating today's discussion with the candidates. I do want to thank my my CMO leadership team for their role here today as well. I uh, thank you to all you candidates um, and, and go, going through the process today. It was wonderful to hear your perspectives on, on the important issues that, that we face as a city. Um, and I, I want to thank the hundreds of people that have participated in the community today watching this and, and who will continue to watch this in the days to come. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, the, this is the beginning of the selection process and, it, and it's going to continue in its rigor from here. Uh, the candidates will be participating in uh, community interview panels. So those panels will include members of our community from uh, the community-based organizations, from faith-based organizations, from neighborhood associations, from racial equity and civil rights organizations, uh, from our own PD staff and, and the police officers association and other law enforcement agencies. So looking forward to that process continuing on with, uh, with all of the candidates. Uh, ultimately, it is my goal to be able to name our a new police chief with the confirmation of the mayor and council by the mid or end of March. So I think that concludes today's process and thank you everyone for participating. Thanks.